we've had a rapid expansion of e-commerce, particularly during the pandemic. Many countries have had constrained revenue sources and uh, others have been worried about the impact of the moratorium on digital industrialization. And uh, so countries question the need to extend the moratorium. Uh, a study by UNCTAD estimates that South Africa could be losing $44 million a year by not um, uh, putting customs duties on 49 uh, digitizable products. There are negotiations in e-commerce rules by some countries, but they're not getting agreement among themselves. And the negotiations uh, address a range of issues. I've highlighted a few there, cross-border data flows, localization of data, technology transfers, and whether there should be a permanent moratorium. South Africa's own position was to continue exploratory work and information sharing under the work program on electric commerce, electronic commerce. The next slide. So at MC12, with vast differences of views between countries, uh, South Africa worked with uh, countries both in the developing world and we also reached out to developed countries to have a, uh, a reinvigorated work program on electronic commerce uh, that would look at, among others, competition, what you classify as electronic transmission, what are new technologies, and how can we ensure that across the world, uh, entrepreneurs and citizens have access to those technologies, the um, implications of e-commerce on traditional means of distribution of physical goods and the financial implications of e-commerce for developing countries. We agreed that the e-commerce moratorium will end in December next year, or if MC13 is postponed, then by March 2024, unless the General Council of the WTO agree otherwise. And uh, in the meantime, uh, it was agreed that WTO members would engage in structured discussions uh, prior to MC13, and that this discussions will also focus on the impact of the moratorium on revenue losses and digital industrialization. Next slide. This introduces the reform of the WTO. That's a ship with many, many containers on it. Uh, developing countries have over a number of years advocated redressing the imbalances arising from WTO agreement. During the Doha development uh, round of uh, the WTO, an agenda was agreed providing a mandate to rebalance trade rules and put the interests of developing countries at the center of work. In the view of developing countries, this development agenda has been frustrated since 2008. The reform now being advanced by some developed countries raise what we call systemic matters that will change the WTO's architecture and the principles on which the WTO uh, is founded and also introduce new issues and approaches that may be inimical to development. For South Africa, um, when we went into the talks, we took the view that WTO reform should rebalance trade rules from the Uruguay round to facilitate Africa's industrialization, that it should deliver on what are a number of mandated issues, issues that have been agreed in the past, like food security and like human development and that it should preserve the WTO core principles and its multilateral character. The next slide. After a long uh, work program by officials, when we got to Geneva, ministers engaged further and we agreed to work towards the necessary reform of the WTO, that the process must be member driven open, transparent, and inclusive, that the work will cover all WTO functions, that's negotiation, the monitoring of um, uh, trade rules, 
and dispute settlement when parties uh, are uh, deemed to be in breach of their commitments. Work will be conducted by the General Council and its subsidiary bodies. And the idea is to have decisions uh, that can be submitted for adoption at the next ministerial conference. The dispute settlement mechanism of the WTO has been disabled mainly because the United States had concerns on the functioning of the appellate body. And MC12 recognized the urgency of addressing this challenge with a dispute settlement system and committed to discussions to seek a well-functioning dispute settlement system by 2024. MC12 reaffirmed the foundational principle of the Marrakesh Agreement, which will underpin WTO reform. Next slide. There are a number of risks from WTO uh, reform because you have many different agendas across the world. The reform of the dispute settlement uh, mechanism could potentially see a return to the pre-WTO era where dispute resolution was shaped by trade power rather than due process. Um, another risk is efforts to introduce pluri the plurilateral agreement <clears throat> that will undermine uh, key principles <clears throat> and consensus decision making. Uh, potential new rules that can constrain industrial policy making, a narrowing of the scope of special and differential treatment, the erosion of a member driven process, and critically, that climate change measures, if they're not carefully handled, can have a negative impact on many developing countries through new environmental tariffs and non tariff barriers, such as the carbon border adjustment mechanism or sometimes it's called the carbon uh, border tax. The next slide uh, just highlights uh, for South Africa what we seek to address policy space on global agreements to enable African industrialization, retaining the development focus of the WTO and special and differential treatment, effective dispute settlement, strengthening the multilateral character and preserving the consensus decision-making principle and other principles. Next slide. This really just wraps it up that the success at MC12 was uh, due to the broad coalition of countries that South Africa worked hard with both North and South to help um, pull uh, a sufficient coalition together. And we were uh, supported by a number of other countries that are sim at a similar view, that the final outcome provides some support for citizens through the flexibilities that we gained in the TRIPS agreement to consumers with measures to discourage export bans on critical foods, to farmers by avoiding new restrictions for South African farmers, to fisher communities with protection against vessels that strip fish our waters, and to entrepreneurs in e-commerce by opening the door to an end to the moratorium on customs duties or adequate support for developing countries in e-commerce. Much more will need to be done to build greater fairness and equity in global trade and truly place development at the center of trade talks. But in that week of discussion in Geneva, developing countries were able to put forward a number of their concerns and get them incorporated in uh, global decision making. And that uh, that uh, wraps up the uh, uh, the uh, presentation, uh, Chairperson. If I can then hand back to the chair. Thank you very much, Minister, for that presentation. Um, we now have an hour or just under an hour. I think, uh, Minister, let me just check. Shall we take discussion, questions and discussions now and then uh, have it a break and then we go back to um, the, the next presentation? 
Is that you are muted, Minister? Thank you, Chair. I would suggest so, Chair, because okay. um, uh, it's quite a quite a, a detailed presentation, and yes. uh, it may it may be more helpful to to members. Okay, I see a hand from Honourable Cuthbert. Can I just take a hand from from members' hands? Okay, while we're waiting for other hands, let me just take Honorable Cuthbert in the meantime. Members, uh, the platform is open for you to raise your questions or clarities. I see other hands now. Alamecha and Honorable Thring. Okay, let's take those three for now. Honorable Cuthbert. Thank you very much, Chair. And I think this was a very interesting presentation. I think it's the first of its kind that we've received throughout the period of the term. And uh, I would encourage the Minister to give us more regular updates. I mean, some of the members of the committee have had the opportunity to go and visit the, the RWTO ambassador in Geneva and obviously hear from her as to what she thinks the pertinent issues are. But I think it's very interesting to hear it directly from the Minister and to see what our positioning is on all of these global issues that are facing us. I think what's most disappointing from a WTO perspective is the continued uh, impasse that surrounds the dispute uh, resolution mechanism. And one would have thought that, uh, you know, a change of God in the US government would have brought about, uh, you know, a restoration of normalized trade relations as well as the proper functioning of the dispute resolute resolution mechanism. And I think that in itself has been rather disappointing. And I would have definitely liked to have seen a change of tack once that change of guard had happened. Um, the second issue, Chairperson, is the exact same thing which I was told when I visited Ambassador Mulumbi Peter was that we obviously had constrained policy space. And this obviously related to industrialization, and the minister has repeated that today. Now, my understanding is the argument is that you know, other or well, Asian tiger countries such as South Korea, Taiwan, and so forth, obviously made use of the lack of these rules to obviously industrialize the economies. And we often hear this as a reason why there's a lot of distinction at the WTO, particularly from the South African position. Now, I'd like to understand from the minister what exact provisions are there that they feel prevent them from being able to industrialize in the same way that the Asian tigers did uh, themselves. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to find out is, I think a few months ago, an extraordinary step was taken uh, by the South African government to lodge a dispute against uh, Spain and the European Union, if I'm correct, in light of citrus exports. I just wanted to know if the minister could kindly give us a status update on that particular matter. And obviously, due to the dispute resolution mechanism, you know, sort of being... Uh, in stasis at this moment in time, I, I don't imagine that that would be processed very quickly, but I'd like to hear, you know, if there's any concessions that have been gained through talk, through uh, initial talks um, with uh, parties on the WTO as well as the EU themselves, because I think that's a very important matter and I think it's one where, uh, you know, particularly the opposition and government are aligned. Uh, we do find that a lot of the phytosanitary standards that are put in place uh, you know, particularly by the EU, are there to discriminate against South African goods and often on, you know, scientifically spurious grounds. And I think that that's common cause amongst all parties to hold that particular view. So I think it would be interesting to find out what the minister's view is on that. Then just broadly, broadly relating <clears throat> to the other issues that um, uh, have been raised by the minister, specifically regarding, uh, you know, fisheries, I think that that was a landmark agreement and I you know, welcome the work that was done on that. It can't be that industries are subsidized by their governments and then expect to you know, play in the same pool as others. I think that you know, subsidies distort trade and particularly if they give an unfair comparative advantage to other economies and you know, we are quite vocal on you know, trying to expand free trade and trying to make sure that we limit barriers and I think it's important that we also you know, identify where things such as fishery as well as agricultural subsidies to store trade and do not allow for fair trade amongst countries. Also, particularly considering the inherent advantage that others have having industrialized 
and having had more developed economies much uh, you know earlier on than what we did. So that's just my, my broad comments for this morning, Chair. And uh, once again, it was a very interesting presentation. Thank you very much, Honorable Cuthbert. Honorable Malamacha. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> yeah, mine is also short. Uh, I think we, we will forever be driven by the talk that says business of business is business. One is much more concerned, especially if we are to zoom to fishery to say, as much as we want to balance and regulate the business itself in the water. Now, how is to be specific with our own country, where large of people have been denied to be part and parcel of this sector on the basis of the granting of the licensing. Now, those who are in there say, no, only this scale is allowed for you to do business to avoid overproduction of fishes. Then yet here, our intention is to bring as many as possible industrialists in a form of also balancing in redressing the, the past. Then uh, how do we squeeze ours so that when we are saying there's a fair play, even the players are fair in terms of the numbers? Because if we don't go that route, the danger is that those who have been there long are now monopolizing the entire sector and are benefiting more than those who are supposed to be coming in as the newcomers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Thring. Honorable Thring, you are still muted. Mm -hmm. Jay, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. All right. My your reception is very poor. Apologies, I'm actually traveling <clears throat> on my way to Chad, and that's the reason. But uh, okay. I visited Germany, Minister, around 20, uh, 2008, 2009, uh, together with a group called the De Democracy Development Program, um, accompanied by colleagues from the ANC and the, and the DA. Many of them at the time did not understand uh, the effect of oversubsidization or subsidization uh, by your developed countries uh, and how that skews. Uh, the, pl the playing field. So uh, I'm, I'm quite interested to hear because I raised it in Germany when we visited the German parliament um, and the representative from Germany acknowledged that uh, it's unfair, uh, unfair practice by particularly your developed nations uh, as compared to your developing nations and, and, uh, and poorer countries to apply that particular practice. So it's, it's, I'm quite interested to, to hear how far those nego negotiations are um, to scrap uh, that kind of practice, particularly by your developed nations. And then secondly, uh, Minister, the, the, um, the strength that your developed nations have in negotiations, because they, to a large extent, were the referees, perhaps, and players at the same time, when the rules... Uh, regarding the WTO were actually established. Uh, how far also are negotiations in terms of leveling that particular playing field where, you know, previously you had nations that had their veto powers and uh, one nation could actually just, you know, veto a very good recommendation in terms of leveling playing fields. So those would be my, my two questions uh, to, to the minister. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Thring, Honorable Mbuyani. Chairperson, thank you very much. Uh, let me also welcome the presentation by the minister. At least now I'm able to follow because I once attended the, the double uh, TF. Uh, Chairperson, let me start with the MC12 now uh, in terms of the food security and also the ag agricultural uh, declaration. Uh, the minister alluded to the fact that uh, the MC12 was a success because at some stage they were able to agree in terms of food security and agriculture. Uh, and also there were decisions that were taken by the world food product, the domestic food production, 
and also the process of safeguards uh, that uh, some people must buy the surplus uh, production. Uh, I just want to check the, the, the minister as well in terms of the TRIPS uh, agreement, the waiver. Uh, maybe I can cite an example, the US versus the China. Uh, the process of cannot export more than 50% of your production uh, to other countries. And also spe specific uh, production line and labeling in terms of that. Maybe the, the last one will be the, the question of uh, what role should the trade and investment play in achieving a sustainable development? Uh, because really, if trade cannot play uh, a sustainable development role, uh, that means maybe they will also be uh, bounded by the pluralism, uh, not the issue of. Uh, and also maybe ask the chair, uh, I mean, the, the minister to, to check uh, through you, Chairperson, the administrative part, because now there's WTO and also there's administration there, uh, which is which. And I think the, the minister can be able to assist us to say, are we able to have the negotiation subcommittees at, the, at that level or the administrative part? They can just negotiate on the site and have the arrangement before they come into, uh, into the WTO. Uh, maybe the last one, the Marrakesh uh, uh, agreement in terms of the micro and the multilateral the issues, the global renewal deal, the coherent narrative. Uh, I think the uh, minister will be able to assist us because uh, there was a narrative that uh, if you want to deliver a trade agenda for sustainable future, we must be able to move from supply chain to value chain. That means you have to have a mobility in terms of food and agriculture, and also governance and infrastructure uh, that will be able to uh, radically uh, change in terms of the, the disruptions of food and the supply chain. Mm. No, I'll post there for now, Chairperson, maybe if I can get another chance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Honorable Minister, over to you for responses. And I will just hold on. I see uh, Honorable Cuthbert has another question. Honorable Cuthbert. Thanks, Chair. Sorry, I omitted, I omitted this at the beginning. Um, just the, the other two questions that I wanted to ask the Minister, the first one being is I have previously engaged with the department on, you know, why there's been not much movement, particularly on, you know, electronic goods and services. And one of the reasons is forward, or the reasons forwarded to me was obviously a lack of local capacity. Now, if you look at the way in which the master plans are structured and the industries that have been identified, there hasn't been too much focus on, you know, industries that could allow us to develop this kind of capability. And in light of you know, the ongoing negotiations as well as, you know, the timelines that have been set uh, for the moratorium to come to an end. Um, would it not then be prudent for focus to be placed on these kinds of industries that emanate, uh, you know, from this kind of agreement and to make sure that we have the necessary capacity to compete on this front, in addition to the revenue collection benefit we would get, um, you know, by instituting certain tariffs on these items which are currently tariff free. Uh, the last thing that I just want to, to mention, Chen, it's maybe a little bit more of a comment, but <clears throat> you would have seen, Minister, that uh, President Xi Jinping and President Biden met on the sidelines of the G20 and in essence agreed to a lowering of the temperature between China and the US. Um, what is your personal view on how this will bode for you know, future negotiations at the like of the WTO? Because we would know that that was one site of serious conflict that led 
to, you know, the suspension of the dispute resolution mechanism? And, you know, how would you use this particular, uh, you know, tempering down of the situation to try and advance our own trade goals and objectives from a South African perspective? Thank you, Honorable Cuthbert. Back to you, Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Uh, first, let me let me thank members uh, for what I thought um, were some really uh, insightful questions uh, that have come out, and also thank you for the uh, the comments uh, uh, with which members receive the presentation. If I start with the um, <clears throat> the broader question that. Um, uh, 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 Honorable Cuthbert raised at the start on the constrained policy space and say that essentially, if we look at the, the development of the Asian tiger model, but even before that, we look at the history of industrialization in Europe. Uh, during the period when those rapid industrialization programs uh, took off, there were no, what are called in trade talks, there were no disciplines uh, that were imposed on national governments by anyone outside a national government itself. So parliaments would do so, uh, cabinets would do so, but there would be a high degree of policy autonomy and policy space. And countries were able to develop using a range of tools. Uh, and some of these would be the use of strategic subsidies and uh, technical support. For example, in the United States, the US has built a formidable technological base to their economy in part through quite um, a, a targeted spending on military, through the military budget. Uh, the United States has been able to uh, secure groundbreaking breakthroughs that were then applied to industrial products. In fact, uh, there's a very interesting uh, bit of work that has been done by um, uh, Mariana Matsukato, uh, who serves on uh, the President's uh, Economic Advisory Council. And she's taken uh, the mobile phone, the smartphone, and she's broken uh, down the different components that make up that phone and showed how state support in a number of areas from the GS, uh, from the global uh, uh, satellite positioning to the, um, the touch screen to a range of other components have benefited from investment by governments in science and innovation, which of course is an important driver of uh, industrial development. Now, in the era of the WTO, for traditional sectors, you're talking your clothing and textile sector, steel and so on, there's been significant uh, disciplines put on any support that can be rendered by governments um, for uh, their local industries to help transform those industries into more competitive um, uh, technology-led industries. Those same disciplines don't apply to many uh, parts of the, the, the spending by governments, particularly in developed countries, although to be fair, not only in developed countries. So that's one example of it. The second example of it is the strategic use of tariffs. Now, as, as we've, we've uh, discussed in the committee previously, uh, a country that seeks simply to put up its tariffs to the highest level across all products is likely to find that it gets temporary um, uh, benefit, but with a real danger that its, uh, its economy becomes uncompetitive because local players can rely on that protection and are un, um, uh, unchallenged. Uh, they're not, they don't have the, um, the need to innovate, to find better processes, technologies, improve skills, higher productivity, and so on. On the other hand, um, we have not seen um, uh, many successes in instances where countries have just 
uh, in an unstrategic manner, um, removed all of their protection. So historically, both Asian tigers and um, the earlier phase of development, uh, developed countries were able to use uh, targeted and carefully uh, calibrated uh, tariffs to support their industries. In fact, interestingly, we've seen uh, a return to some of that now by developed countries. The Uruguay round introduced the number of disciplines that limits the ability of states to use the instruments of public power to try to improve the competitiveness of the industry. And if I can link that to an observation made by Honorable Mbuyani on shifting uh, to value chains. Global supply chains are a critical part of a, a global economy in which we, we are interdependent. If South Africa was sought to cut itself off from the world and not trade, there would be no place left for us to sell our gold and our platinum and our un other mineral riches. And so in that sense, trade makes a lot of sense. The challenge is trade in what? If you limit yourself to trade in only minerals and agricultural products, the return to you as a country is very limited. So uh, countries all look to move up the value chain. They don't only want to be <clears throat> in someone's supply chain producing widgets. They want to get to the point where you have the highest return to the entrepreneurs, the best wages to workers, and the best opportunity for uh, governments to uh, secure a share of that through taxation that can then be used to build um, either social uh, systems, uh, welfare systems, or um, <clears throat> economic support systems like the science and technology uh, systems, uh, public universities, and so on. So that's what trade talks is about, how to get to a point where we have countries across the world with divergent interests that build a, a common uh, set of rules. Uruguay was in one way a big step forward for the world because it, um, it led to the World Trade Organization that said uh, that instead of power being the only basis for decision-making, we'll have an agreed set of rules and we'll have a dispute settlement system in instances where any one country believes another country has not uh, uh, obeyed the rules, have not um, worked within the rules. On the other hand, Uruguay, though, locked some developing countries. South Africa was a classic example because of the stage of transition we were at. It locked us into commitments that gives us less flexibility in some areas than even developed countries have in respect of the kind of support that we can give either in service markets or in goods markets. So that's really what... Um, what that is about. Um, so I've given uh, these two examples. I can also say, of course, the Asian Tigers benefited enormously from uh, very strong preferential access, unilateral access to markets. We have benefited as South Africa and as Sub-Saharan Africa from a goer, um, and we're seeking to, to secure more of that gain uh, in future. And we, we had that conversation uh, at the last time that um, uh, I had an opportunity to address uh, the committee. Turning to the dispute settlement mechanism, I think, uh, Honorable Cuthbert, you, you, you're absolutely right that this is an area that um, is quite fundamental to the operation of the global trading system. If you have rules, you need to have an adju adjudicative process uh, to determine how to deal with breaches of those rules. In the World Trade Organization, it's quite a complex uh, one. Let me take uh, the point before the, the uh, collapse of the dispute uh, settlement mechanism. When one country, let's say the United States is an example or India is an example, provides support to their industries, another country can challenge that. So India, for example, in order to 
uh, build a, um, a green industrial uh, economy, uh, put in place some support mechanisms for their uh, for the production of components for the green industry, and there was a complaint raised against them. In that complaint, there's first uh, there are two levels at which it's taken. The first level is really um, a panel that seeks to get to um, uh, a, 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 um, a finding on the facts and uh, encourage the parties uh, to implement uh, a, uh, uh, the, the, the finding. The, the more difficult one is where there's a binding decision that is taken by the appellate uh, body of the dispute settlement system, where which is then binding not only on that country, but it over time has developed uh, what you can call a jurisprudence on trade. Now, from the United States point of view, they've taken the view that the jurisprudence that is developing was never agreed to by WTO members, that WTO members have um, looked at these dispute settlement bodies to deal with a case-specific outcome and no more than that. And that sovereign uh, countries are now trapped in a body of international law that they haven't signed up on. So that would be the one argument that the United States raised. From the South African side, we've raised the issue <clears throat> that if you don't have a binding dispute settlement system, <clears throat> then even though you have trade rules, powerful countries can impose their will. And a very good example is the measures taken by the United States against South African steel and aluminium exports, where there is no coherent ground on trade law for excluding South African products. And the United States has relied on essentially a national security provision, the section 232, of um, <clears throat> uh, that they've applied uh, to limit uh, the export of steel and aluminium by South Africa. We seek now to have a fit for purpose dispute settlement mechanism because developing countries have not been completely happy with the old system. It's cumbersome, it's extremely expensive, uh, it um, uh, requires enormous resources that many smaller countries are unable to uh, to put in place. So um, a wider reform of the dispute settlement mechanism is necessary, but we have both bilaterally with the United States and in the wider discussion emphasized the importance of um, resolving the impasse on the particularly the appellate uh, body of the WTO. On Spain, um, yes, we've, we've uh, um, started the proceedings in uh, the World Trade Organization. We've also had very extensive discussions uh, that uh, we've had with the European Union. Uh, I have met with the, uh, the Vice President of the European Union, who also holds the portfolio of Trade Commissioner to put forward South Africa's uh, concerns. We've met uh, with uh, the Spanish uh, government during the recent state visit. And we are now engaged in discussions. Uh, I had asked a team of officials to go to, to Brussels uh, recently to engage with their counterparts. And um, uh, I, I am now due to have uh, a further engagement with my counterpart. We remain hopeful that we are that we will be able to resolve the the matter of um, particularly false uh, coddling moth. Uh, this is the the latest uh, sanitary and phytosanitary issue that the European Union has used to block effectively South African exports of citrus products. Now it's the second one. Before that, it was citrus black spot and. What we've said to the European Union is that for more than 100 years, South Africa exported um, citrus fruit to the European uh, countries. This is even predating the European Union. And all of the fears that Europe now raises 
that uh, citrus black spot can uh, um, uh, jump from oranges that we export to Europe onto the orange trees and uh, uh, affect their production. None of that has been um, scientifically shown. On the contrary, there is no evidence of uh, any, uh, any of the fears that Europe has raised. And we've made the point that it's at the time when South African farmers became more successful globally and in the European market in selling citrus products that suddenly these uh, plant diseases as they would regard them were discovered and are being used now to alert our entry to the European uh, market. And we've made this, we've said this is a fundamental issue for us. And so we will uh, seek to first have a solution through dialogue and discussion, but failing that, uh, uh, we will take the matter uh, to, the, uh, to the highest level. There are a number of ways in which we can address the issue of a dysfunctional uh, appellate uh, body in the World Trade Organization when we take the citrus matter up. Uh, we also have um, uh, uh, the, the facility uh, available to have agreed arbitration with a panel of arbitrators that are chosen between the parties. But um, uh, our hope still is that in the discussions that are underway at the moment, we can reach an agreement. We have found that in engaging the Spanish government, and Spain, of course, is uh, the world's biggest exporter of uh, citrus fruit. South Africa is the world's second biggest uh, exporter that the Spanish government has acknowledged that they understand the depth of concern that South Africa has. And this has been elevated uh, at the time of discussion uh, by the president with his counterpart, uh, Prime Minister Sanchez. Uh, president Ramaphosa has also raised it with the president of um, the European uh, uh, Union um, uh, in, himself and we are engaging with other senior members of the European Union. I hope when we um, have an opportunity in the new year that I can give a more detailed um, uh, uh, report or at least a more positive report. Obviously, because we engage in the negotiations at the moment, um, I'm, I'm going to be um, a little bit constrained on, on some of the specific points that South Africa is raising, but uh, this is the wider issue is, is absolutely true that we've seen particularly in Europe, uh, a greater use of sanitary and phytosanitary measures to limit our products, whether they are game meat that we sell uh, in the European Union, whether it is the export of horses uh, to, to Europe and to the Middle East, whether it is um, uh, access for uh, some of our other uh, livestock uh, and, uh, and access for other agricultural products. So we, the world is seeing now uh, some countries, some trading blocks are using uh, SPS measures uh, as disguised protection for their markets. And uh, this is a challenge that we're going to have to, um, to crack in the World Trade Organization. There are legitimate SPS measures that countries are entitled to use, uh, but we've seen a greater use of it than is, uh, is warranted. On the fisheries agreement, it was, yes, it was a landmark agreement in, in many respects, and it was particularly important to South Africa because honorable members will know that our, uh, our coastline is, is, is very long, it's, it's um, and it's been subject to predation and um, where uh, fishing vessels, sometimes from Taiwan, sometimes from other countries, including uh, uh, sometimes European countries, have overfished uh, and have done so uh, often contrary to the rules. And this is an opportunity now for us to have a rules-based system. South Africa was nominated by a large group of fishing nations, the ACP nations, that's the African, Caribbean, and Pacific nations, uh, to coordinate uh, the input of ACP countries in the World Trade Organization talks. 
We had very positive conversations with the European Union and with the United States. We engaged uh, in a lot of detail with India, who was very concerned about artisanal and subsistence fishing. And we were able, through those engagements, to contribute to laying the basis for what is what was finally an agreement that was reached at the WTO. On e-commerce, um, uh, I think, uh, Honorable Cuthbert, uh, the, the point um, that you, you've made is, is an important one, that for, for South Africa, while there are two objectives, yes, we want to, to ensure that we are able to, um, to have access to uh, the revenue collection, but even more fundamentally, is to develop an e-commerce capability. We're already quite a significant e-commerce player, uh, both in our domestic economy, we have uh, significant platforms, and um, uh, we are one of the leading ones on the African continent. But compared, say, to the enormous capacity that the United States or China has, think of, of um, Amazon, think of um, Alibaba, um, we are, are relatively small players. So what we've done is while there hasn't been a, a master plan specifically on e-commerce, what we have done is we've put a master, place in, uh, a master plan in place around global business services, which of course is a form of uh, services that is um, mediated through these uh, digital platforms. So essentially, there are tens of thousands of South Africans now who are employ employed to be the, the call agents that provide services. So if you're a customer in a bank in um, England and you phone your local bank, to query, let's say, an overdraft amount or something like that, the, um, the call is routed to South Africa through our electronic infrastructure, and it's answered by a South African, perhaps a woman in Mitchell's Plain uh, or from Kailicha, who then takes the customer through the issue. So, that's already a growing part of our offering, but there's a lot more that we can do. So part of our discussion at the World Trade Organization has been precisely that, how we can get the necessary space to build a um, e-commerce and to strengthen our e-commerce infrastructure. So the global business services is one leg, the WTO is another leg, and then the third leg is the competition commission is doing the uh, market inquiry that's looking at a number of these online platforms. Uh, they include e-commerce platforms, the um, various um, uh, platforms around um, uh, accommodation, uh, car purchases, uh, property purchases, and so on. It is um, our intention that the, uh, the work would be completed by or before the end of February. And this will give enormous um, insight and also uh, outcomes, measures that can be taken that introduces more competition and more capability in this, um, in this market. So this is more and more people globally are being employed in this area. It does raise quite significant and deep competition issues, which uh, the Competition Commission is looking at now. But this is an area that we, <clears throat> we want to back more growth of the sector and also find opportunities for small businesses uh, to really thrive in that ecosystem. Around uh, the history of industrialization. And uh, it was famously said that developed countries kick away the ladder of development, the very means that they've used to build their capacity is then kicked away that developing countries that follow in their wake are unable <clears throat> to, to utilize. Then um, Honorable Malamecha also raised the question on the fisheries industry, how we resolve local fishery industry challenges by granting them licenses 
um, <clears throat> and avoid the monopolization of the sector. Now that's domestic policy. It doesn't go directly to the trade talks at the World Trade Organization, but I know Minister Barbara Crisi is very aware of this challenge and is seeking to find ways in which the licensing system and the quota system uh, enables smaller players to come in. Here's the challenge. The challenge is <clears throat> that for those quotas <clears throat> and those licenses to be meaningful, we need to ensure that our coastline is not overfished. And, and that's where the World Trade Organization talks come in, that while it has not resolved all of the issues, within the toolkit of the World Trade Organization, it's taken a significant step forward, uh, Honorable uh, Malamecha. Honorable uh, Tring has raised the question of subsidies by developed nations and the leveling of the playing fields. The irony is, Honorable uh, Tring, that in agriculture, uh, the not only don't we have a level playing field with uh, enormous subsidies by developed nations, but um, the effect of that is that one of the few ways in which many developing countries can improve the quality of life and the employment for their own uh, citizens is being closed off, which then leads to more people uh, getting onto little ships, crossing the Mediterranean, and trying to find a livelihood in, in Europe. So Europe will continue to have enormous migration challenges with large numbers of people moving there as long as Africa remains in a state of underdevelopment and African farmers don't have access to the markets. So when you block African products, unavoidably you're going to find Africans themselves in desperation will seek to enter <clears throat> those societies, those countries. And so a new deal is necessary that rebalances uh, the, uh, the, the ability of, of developing countries to build stronger economies and economies that um, are able to, to meet the needs of their people. And so the points, Honorable Tring, that you've raised and Honorable Malamecha and Honorable Cuthbert have raised all speak I think quite strongly uh, to the same issue and, and uh, government is out there fighting on, on exactly these issues. Honorable Mbuyani, the, the matters of food security, as you rightly point out, came up in MC12. We were particularly keen to support the World Food uh, Program that the, the work that is being done uh, by uh, a number of countries to ensure that wherever possible, we're able to buy food stocks that can go to parts of the world that are either uh, gripped in a cycle of poverty or where there's a natural disaster like a drought or floods and so on. And we were able to secure uh, some um, uh, critical protection for those measures uh, in the World Trade Organization. On the TRIPS waiver, historically, uh, the, the flexibilities in the TRIPS agreement were available to countries that want to use it subject to a number of rules, but they could not use it uh, such oh that they export um, <clears throat> uh, the majority of the product. Now, if you're a, if you're a very big economy, uh, that may not be such a big constraint. But if you are South Africa, it means you could never really use that because if you're producing only for the South African market, the product will be so expensive uh, and it will be therefore unaffordable. So the very need you're trying to address to get um, ex um, access to uh, citizens uh, or for citizens to life-saving medication will not be realized. So within the very flexibilities of the original TRIPS rules, there is a break put in that mean you can't move forward. So we spend a lot of time uh, seeking to, uh, to put this argument to the European Union, to the United States, to the UK, Switzerland, Japan, and, um, and other countries that were originally concerned about the waiver uh, proposal. And in the final document, 
there is no such constraint. As long as we export to other developing countries that are eligible under, under this term. So that was quite an important uh, breakthrough. Trade and investment really are big drivers of development. You, you're not able to, to, to create jobs and uh, improve the lives of citizens by governments uh, simply running public works programs and so on. There's a role for it. But fundamentally, it's about the ability to increase your industrialization footprint to produce more. And while we've emphasized localization, clawing back more on the domestic market, South Africa also has to export more of that product. Because when you export uh, on scale, your markets are bigger, your prices come down, your innovation, your, your resources for innovation uh, uh, is, is, is more. And also... The disciplines of exporting means that you, you're forced to, to find ways of constantly becoming more competitive. So it's the combination of all these measures uh, that I think were highlighted in the World Trade Organization talks. Uh, finally, coming to Honorable Cuthbert's question on uh, President Xi Jinping and President Biden um, uh, seeking to 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 to, to tamper down the heat that has been generated uh, over geopolitical tensions. I think um, yeah, it's, it's good for global uh, trade and development because wars and not only the, the, uh, the kind of wars that we've seen in Ukraine where the parties are engaged in battle, but also the, the potential threats of physical conflict as we've seen um, uh, in in the South China uh, South China Sea's area, disrupt global supply chains. South African automakers, for example, were forced to close their operations here in South Africa for a number of days because there was a shortage of semiconductor uh, semiconductors, what they call these chips that go into uh, the making of the um, the electronic systems for cars. And that was in part as a result of COVID, but also the geopolitical tensions have contributed to um, and exacerbated these ones. What South Africa seeks to do is to position South Africa and the African continent as a important source of, for the production of goods in a, a world where risk is being factored much more into decision makers um, uh, calculation that if you want to de-risk, you need to uh, expand your, uh, your procurement to South Africa and to the African continent. So instead, instead of high-risk procurement where the world's entire uh, supply of a given product is in one country or one region, uh, we're seeking now to position the African continent as uh, a critical means for businesses, whether those businesses are in China or they are in the United States, for them to de-risk their, their supply chain. In addition to that, uh, the lowering of global tensions will also encourage more investment because investors often press the pause button in periods of um, heightened tension. And in the president's investment conference in April next year, uh, in, in the context of lower global tensions, we are likely to have a, a stronger appetite from global uh, investors uh, to invest in South Africa. And thirdly, of course, export markets that um, if, if tensions are lowered, it provides an opportunity for South Africa uh, to sell more of our own products in markets uh, elsewhere in the world. Those markets are often more constrained in times of, um, of global tension. So on the investment side, on the trade side, meaning South, South Africa and the African continent as a procurement destination, and through our exports, all of those can benefit from a world that is at peace, uh, or at least a world where there are lower levels of uh, global tensions. So thank you very much, uh, Chairperson, for these probing, thoughtful, and very strategic questions that um, honorable members have raised. 
that all go to, um, uh, to, to areas that are important for us in the conduct of our work in the World Trade Organization. And I think all South Africans can be very proud because it was really the collective work of South Africa Inc. Uh, that um, in the World Trade Organization, South Africa was able to provide enormous leadership at times when it looked in those early few days um, in Geneva, it looked like the trade talks would all stall and deadlock. And, um, and uh, South Africa, our negotiators, uh, played a key role in reaching out to many different parts of the world and helping to bring parties together uh, into what was ultimately a, a meaningful set of agreements that were reached. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Thank you very much, Minister, for that update. Honorable Mbiani, is that a legacy and... Or do you have any questions? Sorry, 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 Chair. It's a, it's a legacy okay. head. Okay, no, that's yeah. fine. Members, but, we will now take a break until, um, I think, let's see if we can restart at five past 11. Uh, so we'll just take a 15 minute break. And then, uh, Minister, we'll go back to you. I think you need to give your vocal cords a bit of a rest before we continue. Thank you very much, members. We'll break for 15 minutes. Thank you.
key uh, outcomes that we pursue. And the link to the DTIC budget vote is in the budget vote um, uh, in May this year, I had announced that the Black Exporters Conference would be held during 2022. The next slide, uh, it highlights uh, what the platform, the uh, conference was seeking to do, which was to reflect progress in advancing redress and transforming uh, the economy uh, and discuss initiatives to, to do more in this regard. It highlighted Black industrialists' capabilities, their contribution to the economy, and it celebrated and recognized those successes. And finally, I identified some challenges. This slide here sets out <clears throat> at a glance some of the key things. More than 800 Black firms participated, 1,300 participants, uh, a number of exhibitors, 139 media coverage, many panelists and speakers, number of cabinet members, uh, 10 excellence awards that were uh, uh, yeah, issued or, or um, awarded, five DFIs um, uh, and 22 banking and finance officials from the private sector and nine buyers from big retailers, including MassMart, ShopRite, Woolworths, the Fushini Group, and Pick and Pay. The next slide uh, uh, really highlights uh, for the uh, committee the five platforms. So while we call it a conference, it was really five major events that would often be held separately. And we brought these five events together. Uh, the first of that was the traditional conference forum of plenary speeches and breakaway panels and discussions, ideas, uh, and so on. The second one is the launch of networks of support uh, with the president. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the third one was marketplace, where we brought together the products of a number of black industrialists, uh, similar to exhibitions that were held in the past, but this time it was really structured to highlight um, the, the, the strengths of, uh, of a number of, of businesses in our economy. The fourth one was an award of excellence. This would typically be a, an award that the president would, would do as a standalone event. It was now wrapped into, um, into one of the five platforms. And finally, an information media and public awareness uh, platform. And we'd like to take the committee through these five platforms in the remainder of the, the presentation. Uh, but um, uh, in, in the next uh, slide, we really uh, want to let people speak for themselves. I hope members' um, uh, uh, Wi-Fi's would be able to take uh, the bandwidth that's required. But if I can ask uh, Sulu to see if we can uh, start this. Is it just me or is there no sound on the video? We're going to ask Sula just to try to fix the sound issue. We'll give it another try. If it doesn't work, we can come back to this right at the end. It's the typical problem we often have with um, Zoom uh, when we try to use videos. It's a real pity, Chairperson, that we don't have sound because it's a really interesting, though very short video that highlights the stories of Black uh, industrialists. Um, uh, Minister, maybe Tsulu can click on the on the uh, microphone or the speaker here on the right hand side of the slide, and maybe just up the volume. You know, on the other side. It seems that um, uh, we haven't quite mastered um, uh, the trick, uh, Chairperson. Uh, still, if you scroll, yeah, that you see the little speaker at the um, there. I think that's what the chair is uh, referring to. Um, now it's on mute there. I would suggest, Chair, that we um, 
it's a real pity because it's a powerful short video in which people tell their own stories uh, and it would really have um, provided a good context but I, I was fearful that um, Zoom uh, may let us uh, down or our own uh, IT um, skills may let us down. Uh, I can't blame Zoom for this one. Maybe if, uh, if uh, Tulu just clicks on, on that. You need to take it up higher. It's a wonderful moment where the chair of the committee is giving us technical uh, support. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to work, though. Unless uh, it's not working. Um, <clears throat> so what I would suggest is um, we're going to have to deprive committee members of a really interesting video. If we can make it work in the course of the, um, the uh, uh, discussion, even if it's after the Q&A session, then we can do so. Uh, but I would suggest to save time, let's move to the next slide. Okay, so we are, we're now going to deal with the five platforms for Black Industors and Black Exporters Conference. Uh, the next slide then starts with the uh, first platform. And this was the forum discussions, what one would traditionally uh, know as a conference. It was a plenary session uh, that we had that was addressed by the president and uh, the, uh, the ministry uh, too. And then six high level panel sessions that looked at uh, various topics, the impact of broad-based empowerment. What can we celebrate? Where are we? Strengthening the impact of transformation. What should we focus on? Where do we go? Facilitating transformation, we look there at the role of supplier development and procurement. Then next, we look at financing uh, for black industrialists, uh, exports in the AFC FTA, and finally, the impact of broad-based black economic empowerment. Next slide. This was really the president's uh, keynote address. We've highlighted some extracts uh, of what the president had said, where he provided a little bit of context to the, um, the uh, uh, conference, uh, and he pointed to some of the numbers. We'll come back to some of those uh, shortly. Uh, next uh, slide. More from the president, where he uh, refers to the 28 years uh, 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 into democracy, what are some of the barriers we faced, and why, in spite of these barriers, we've made progress, and why we celebrate that progress. The next uh, slide uh, looks at the, uh, uh, the need for the public and private sector to coordinate, but it also says, and here the president made the point, um, that we need to talk about the inefficiencies in the economy that affect established and emerging businesses alike. Uh, the steps to improve the state of port, rail lines and roads, the far reaching reforms in telecommunications, energy and water, and uh, really uh, recognizing that uh, if we have load shedding, uh, you'll see the uh, president said, in particular, we need to act decisively and urgently to end the load shedding that is causing such damage to our economy, such disruption to our society. Uh, like every other actor in the economy, black industrials can simply not grow without a reliable supply of affordable energy. The next slide is really just a a number of people were panelists. You see the Minister of Finance there in the middle at the bottom, uh, and you'll see the uh, the Chairman of MassMart uh, also there. Um, if we if we go to the next slide, um, in that forum discussion, you see a little snapshot of some of the uh, attendees. Next slide. Similar. Next slide. Uh, a shot from the back, next slide. Further shot, next slide. 
This was the, the first panel discussion after the plenary session. It was moderated by Minister Gurungwana. The panel members were uh, Gloria Serobi, who was the um, uh, director of Whiphold, uh, Kuseni Lamini, the chairperson of Massmart, uh, Busi Mabuza, the chair of IDC, and Cindy Mabaso Koyana, the chairperson of Auka Investment Holdings. Next slide. Here yeah, we just summarize some of the key points that came up, some proposals made by panelists. I'm not going to run through all of these uh, in detail, Chair, because we had pre-circulated uh, a version of the presentation with it. Um, but really the points that came up in this was uh, commercializing innovative products and services, generating new industries, uh, the need to, to have more innovative funding structures, including venture capital to support uh, uh, black entrepreneurs, the role of both the banks and the financial institutions, and the need to have a, a focus on global markets. Next slide. This is where um, I had moderated the session and we had panel members, uh, Nolita uh, Fakude, the chairperson of Anglo-American, Ilias Monahi, president of the Black Business Council, Zungiswa Losi, the president of Kosatu, <clears throat> um, Kabisi Jonas, the chairperson of MTN, and Sabine Dalomo, the CEO of Siemens uh, South Africa. Uh, next slide. Here are some of the key points that transformation is not only ownership, Skills development of ordinary workers is critical. There's a role for master plans. Worker ownership is widely welcome. Uh, that wealth generated must be reinvested, that we need to work on a cycle of wealth creation and reinvestment as opposed to consumption. That corruption in, in procurement damages legitimate black uh, entrepreneurship and must be tackled as part of our efforts to highlight uh, the achievements of genuine black industrialization or industrialists. We talked about localization and its uh, importance and that the successes of broad-based empowerment is not always well communicated. And uh, this is not simply a government responsibility. All of society should uh, take this forward. Next slide. Some proposals on uh, supporting sustainable businesses. I'll point out the fourth one which is an ecosystem of support by black industrialists for other emerging black businesses. That it's not always the state or large businesses that must play a role, but that we need to encourage uh, a, a, a view that successful black businesses need to pull others also up. Uh, next slide. This was a panel on facilitating transformation and the role of supplier development and procurement. Uh, Minister uh, Nchaveni uh, was the moderator. We had the CEO of Transnet, uh, Persia Dabi, uh, the uh, chief uh, procurement officer acting from Treasury, Mulef Ifani, the managing director of Coca-Cola, Velapi, uh, Rachefola, the uh, uh, divisional financial manager of ShopRite, Maud Mudise, uh, the owner and founder of Ikukasa Green, Tami Kowa, the uh, Black Business Council CEO, Hanki Matabani, and the director of Samsung, Shlubi Shivanda. Next slide goes into key points, some proposals made by panelists looking at competition, multi-stakeholder elder alliances, networks, and um, the tracking of um, the impact of what we do. Next slide. This was chaired by Minister Mamloko Kubai and Harold Harvey. Uh, panel members included the CEO of the IDC, Tipin Chocho, the CEO of Standard Bank, Sam Shabalala, uh, the head of the NEF, Pilisi Tetwa, the uh, principal partner of Identity Partners, Sonia De Bruyne, uh, the uh, executive director of Naledi Ringrollers, Sibusiso Mapatiani, 
and the CEO of Rail to Rail, uh, Ms. Zikita Zatu Moloi. Next slide. This highlighted some key points, what we were seeking to do, uh, the capital and financing gap, uh, bankability uh, as being important, which refers to getting projects to a point where the private sector can also come in and financially um, <clears throat> uh, underwrite those measures. Um, and uh, some proposals on the risk appetite of the banking sector, coordination issues came up, a uh, portal of information on what's available uh, by both the public and private sector and ease of funding systems. You can call it the red tape part of it. Next slide. It was moderated by Minister Toko Di Diza. Panel members included the COO of the Export uh, Credit Insurance Corporation, uh, Mandisi Kushlu, the CEO of Oya Foods, Rehama Issa, uh, the head of BT Industrial Homozo Lekola, uh, the CEO of Seven Sisters, Vivian Kleinhans, the MD of AMCA, Nizam Kala, and um, the CEO of Easy Farm, Luvengwa uh, Nemao Rani. The next slide really highlights some of the panel discussions, the proposals made, and the announcement that ECIC and IDC are working together to see how they can create a collaborative facility of export finance and credit insurance. Next slide. It was moderated by Minister Tulas Nesi and Ayabonga Kawe, panel members from um, uh, the Association of Black Securities and Investment Professionals, uh, chairperson of the NEF, uh, the executive chair of Rothschild, uh, uh, and uh, the president's economic advisor, so these were Polo uh, Leteka, Mutabiseng Moleko, Martin Kingston, and Trudy Makaya. Next slide. Some key points um, that's come out. Uh, the country's come a long way since the narrow focus on highly leveraged ownership deals uh, that BEE needs to be complemented with economic diversification and structural change. You need a stronger and more agile uh, bureaucracy uh, and, and, and a state that, that actually gets things um, uh, done more quickly than, than many business people experience. And the important role of public procurement. Next slide. Some proposals made on review of codes and charters, uh, the uh, growth of small and medium enterprises, and dealing with concentrated product and service markets, and um, the, uh, the role of various institutions to um, uh, support uh, entry into new markets, particularly export markets. New, um, uh, next slide. So this goes to the second platform. This is where we brought together a number of um, <clears throat> business people and others. <clears throat> so we launched, for example, uh, a number of entities. This was the public launch of the broad-based Black Economic Empowerment Council. Uh, next slide. This uh, sets out a little bit of background on the council. Honorable members would be familiar with this. Next slide. This is the launch of the Black Exporters Network that brings together a number of business people that are already active in exports and want to use their combined efforts to strengthen South Africa's export effort further. Next slide. This really just provides a little bit of information. Um, the uh, current membership is close to 80. It continues to grow. They're in sectors like auto components, food, machinery, doors, clothing, energy, chemicals, pharmaceuticals, 
furniture, rail, and so on. And they're in active uh, outside of South Africa in uh, Southern African markets, some are uh, well beyond the African continent, uh, Japan, uh, USA, uh, China, many others. Next slide. This is uh, just to highlight the story of uh, Oya Foods. Um, this was one of the firms that was launched during the pandemic. They do these long shelf life, ready to eat um, or ready to cook uh, food uh, for health conscious consumers. So they include dried veg and beverages ready to drink, snacks, pestos and so on. And then there's a comment um, by <clears throat> the, uh, the founder on um, just what it meant to her to walk around the stalls and see the kind of products that are available that are being produced by Black South Africans. Next slide. This was an um, example of um, a company called Baines Transformer Technology, started by Ernst Baines in, in Gauteng. They manufacture uh, small and medium power transformers, as well as uh, small substations and wind and solar uh, renewable transformers. They have customers as far as the Middle East and um, uh, Ernest Baines' uh, comment uh, after the conference was that uh, they, their expansion into African uh, markets has been strongly promoted by the department, and they find that that's, that's helpful to them, uh, and we hope that those kind of businesses will grow much, much more. Next slide. This uh, uh, is a third example of a company that's part of the um, uh, Black Export uh, Drive, Afro India Rolling Mills. Uh, they produce aluminum and copper alloys. Uh, and there's some information there. They uh, export aluminum ingots to Japan, Indonesia, and Thailand, as well as Italy. Uh, and they produce for Toyota, Honda, and Sato. And um, uh, they've provided Imran, Umar, um, and uh, some of the other people are highlighted there. They uh, talk there about um, uh, the experience of the conference. Next slide. This is uh, a company called Ario. <clears throat> um, Ario Metapower. They design and manufacture power electric, electronic equipment. So these would be inverters. <clears throat> they tell me that, they're only, they, that they are the only producer in South Africa. They also do rectifiers and soft starters. Some of their products go into renewable energy system. <clears throat> uh, Mitsubishi Electric Europe selected them as a preferred supplier of invest, um, inverters. The two co-founders are Dr. Ramatsela uh, Masango, who's the company's chairperson, and Louis Haynes, who's the MD. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Masango is quite an interesting person. She received a PhD in nuclear engineering from Penn State University in the United States. And she previously held the position of senior manager for safety and licensing at the um, uh, PBMR fuel plant. This was the pebble bed um, modular regulator. This was what they would call the, the mini nuclear power plants that South Africa had uh, worked on many years ago. And um, uh, she talks there about um, uh, the Black Exporters Network, and during the conference, you met with potential investor, and they're engaging with us in potential investor. Next slide.
This is just uh, the formal MOU uh, signing ceremony. You see a, a happy, smiling Minister Didiza also there in the background. Uh, and behind all of them will be the president and a number of people who are black exporters. Next slide. Um, other networks, uh, for example, we had a film makers network that was set up. We brought together uh, the auto component makers uh, and uh, black industrial innovators. And they, they're really about connecting black South Africans with other uh, persons in that sector so that they can begin to use the power of networking to <clears throat> uh, open up opportunities, particularly uh, for exports, but also uh, more broadly to grow businesses. Next slide. This was the Black Auto Component Makers. We'll come back to one of the uh, companies that we highlight later in the presentation. So these are people who make the components that go into vehicles. All right, so this third platform is a marketplace of exhibitors where firms showcase what they produce and uh, procurers and investors walk around and, and engage them. And um, this picture shows as you entered this marketplace, there were around 30 food and beverage uh, exhibitors. Next slide. And you'll see a lot of citrus fruit and um, Honorable Cuthbert was uh, asking about uh, access to the, um, the EU market. So it's really, it's an industry that uh, there are a number of players that are really keen to get uh, their products sold because our production exceed by far the capacity of the South African market to absorb. The, the marketplace showcased products from black industrials. It, it helped to lift the profile uh, for financiers, for procurers, and for a broader South African audience through the media coverage. And uh, we did a, a very interactive <clears throat> uh, exhibition. You won't see those kind of boring old style um, uh, exhibition, but it was one where consumers, uh, business people could engage more easily. And there were coffee areas. It was quite, quite well set up. Uh, and uh, the DTIC will now be adjusting all of their future exhibitions to draw on the experience here. Next slide. This is just further pictures. There you see <clears throat> furniture companies. We got them to bring their furniture there and people actually uh, use the furniture for uh, network meetings. You see 32 uh, fashion sector industries uh, with their, uh, their products there. Next slide. In the marketplace, we had 139 businesses. And you'll see they're in agriculture and processing cars and chemicals and plastics and cosmetics and energy and oil and gas and clothing and uh, footwear and foam and furniture in general manufacturing, in innovation and technology sectors, and in metal and mining. And there are two pictures there where the president is <clears throat> with a company, Afro -Bot uh, Botanics, and with uh, Glenn Carroll. Next slide. Uh, we also had visitors booths where uh, the DTIC services and that of the IDC and the NAF were displayed and people could engage uh, at a senior level with the leadership of the entities of the DTIC. Next slide. Some exhibitors even reported that they had sales and uh, some investment interest generated. We had the Eastern Cape Free State, Gauteng, uh, KwaZulu-Natal, Limpopo, Mpumalanga, Northwest and Western Cape uh, businesses represented there. Next slide. Yeah, 
in the marketplace, one of the uh, companies was um, that of Zanele Moholi, uh, who is a Cape Town-based designer and uh, who collaborated with Gavin Raja to produce the uh, a particular homeware collection. And um, uh, this uh, would have included cushions, carpets, throws, curtains, and candles. And then Gavin Raja himself was also a black South African fashion and interior designer, who's uh, launched the Cape Town Fashion Week and was um, invited to show at the Paris uh, Fashion Week. Uh, so this would be all examples of excellence that we're highlighting uh, in, in the um, uh, marketplace. Next slide. And this is a quote from Gavin Raja on his work. Uh, they've been approached to work with South African company to design and manufacture carpets with textile manufacturers to create fabrics. And they're exporting to the US, Italy, and France. Um, and there were uh, a little bit of a picture of this stand with uh, Somyama and Gonyama uh, at, the, uh, at, the, at the stand. Next slide. This was um, a really interesting um, uh, exhibitor, VW, uh, VM Automotive. They supply aluminum and steel products to the auto industry, and they do these metal blanks that are used for the various body parts of vehicles. They've um, manufactured metal blanks for 10 new body parts for the fourth generation uh, Mercedes C-Class, and these were, were parts that were previously imported from Europe. And uh, the C-Class is exported to more than 80 markets around the world. So it means that what a black South African produces here is, is um, the, the cladding, the, um, all of these components that you see, uh, that those who drive Mercedes-Benz uh, across the world in Europe, US and elsewhere, uh, it's all made in a factory uh, in um, uh, uh, South Africa. And uh, the current C-Class is now projected to be exported to 110 countries. And the uh, shareholder and CEO is Gibson Njenje. Next slide. So this is where the president uh, viewed the stand and what was being produced at VM. And uh, there's also some feedback that um, uh, Mr. Njenje has given us uh, on um, uh, OEMs and other potential clients who want to visit uh, uh, his plants. Next slide. Uh, Pamodzi Unique was also showcasing their work. They design and manufacture uh, equipment for mining and chemical and many other products. And you'll see some of their pumps and their uh, pantographs, which is uh, produced um, uh, here. And Cindy um, uh, Seaweed Lamini uh, spoke a little bit about the value of the conference uh, uh, that recognizes both black uh, companies that are pushing through despite the challenges in the economy and it demonstrate um, and instills a sense of pride in the work that are doing. Many black South Africans, they find, they, they often say, make the point that it's quite tough to survive in the business world. And uh, when they are recognized, it makes years of hard work, of sacrifice, of um, often uh, uh, taking risks um, uh, and uh, sometimes paying a, a heavy price for it. It, it, it gives them that, uh, that recognition. Next slide. This was a picture of the president engaging with uh, people who are making uh, all sorts of sources, uh, Black South African making sources that are used uh, in our foods and uh, that enhances uh, and tickles the palate. Uh, next slide. GET Mining Services, they do uh, uh, tools for the mining industry, loading equipment, quite, quite big ones. Um, and um, 
they've been um, <clears throat> uh, in the market for a number of years. And um, Olivia Fuka uh, has given some feedback uh, from the company's uh, point of view. Uh, next slide. This takes us to the fourth platform. It's the Award of Excellence. This was, we had put out a public call for nominations um, and um, we received a, a large number of uh, nominations uh, for different award categories, local manufacturer, innovation and technology, sustainability, job creator, youth industrialists, women industrialists and black exporter were some of the categories you see the number of entries and then the, the number of finalists next slide <clears throat> this was our judging panel uh dr moleko who is the chair of the nef Ms. mabuza the chairperson of the idc mr mashimbie the ceo of proudly south africa and our very own um uh, Ms. Uh, Mabichi Thompson, the DDG of the DTIC. Next slide. We gave a special award, a Pioneer Industrialist Award. And the president um, uh, from uh, the nomination that uh, was put up, the president then made this award. It was given to Gloria Serobi. She was born in Guguletu in the Western Cape. She started a professional career at Exxon Corporation in the US. She returned to South Africa to work in the Premier Group's Epic Oils and then Munich Reinsurance. She then took a cut in salary to escape the routine of accounting and moved into investment and merchant banking with a standard corporate. Um, in 1996, uh, Gloria joined uh, Transnet as Group Financial Director until 2001. Um, that was a time when Transnet was still making money and doing uh, really good things. And she served on the company's board as well as boards of uh, a number of subsidiaries. Uh, later, she founded Whiphold with uh, Louisa Mojela, Wendy Luhabi, and Nomshle Tankra. And she joined the company full time as uh, executive director and later CEO of its subsidiary, Web Capital. So she has had an extraordinary influence on many young women who see a country that ha that is opening up opportunities for uh, for women, for Black South Africans. And after many years of uh, really being a, um, a, a um, an icon in the sector, this was the first opportunity. Uh, for her to be to be recognized, and it was quite quite an emotional moment for her and for the other women in Wapold, which is a, a women's investment uh, holding company. The next slide it looks at the manufacturing award finalists. You see the um, uh, four companies were nominated. You'll see where they're from and all sorts of details and uh, who are there. Uh, main persons. Next slide. BT Industrial was the winner. They manufacture plastic pipes, which are used in the continent as part of infrastructure programs. But during COVID-19, they pivoted and uh, diversified the manufacturing portfolio from engineering into healthcare. And they did uh, personal protective equipment and products. And they produce a medical filter that uh, was used to manufacture masks for export to Europe and the United States. They are diversifying now into the manufacture of syringes that uh, they uh, seek to align to global standards for exports. Next slide. Just really as a, a picture of um, the uh, uh, CEO getting uh, the award uh, from uh, the president with Deputy Minister Majola being um, in that picture. Um, just go back one. So that's the that's the picture there. Next slide. There were uh, four technology and innovation um, finalists: Cape uh, Bio, Daniel, uh, Dima, Batsamaya, Maiv, um, 
Cabo KD and Screamer Electronic Services. Uh, next slide. Cape Bio was uh, uh, regarded as one of the one of the two winners. Uh, Cape Bio is a, a biotechnology company that manufactures the enzymes used in molecular biology research and diagnostics. They produce diagnostic test kits for COVID-19, HIV, syphilis, malaria, um, and they do work on oncology as well as lab consumables and the reagents. They're the first manufacturer of a COVID-19 PCR test to get South African Health Product Regulatory Authority approval and they currently employ 100 people. Uh, and they, they got a really strong um, track record uh, and uh, they supply uh, um, uh, products, not just in South Africa, but outside uh, South Africa and uh, uh, across uh, uh, the world, the US, Canada, India, and so on. Next slide. Uh, so this was the uh, Cape Biology, uh, Cape Biotechnology winner. Next slide. The Sustainability Award finalists. We had uh, companies Pele Green, <clears throat> uh, uh, Low Masters, and Revive Electrical Transformers. Next slide. Pele Green uh, uh, was one of the winners. Uh, they co-developed uh, off-grid generation capacity. They also operate in utility scale and off, uh, 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 in the utility scale and off-grid projects. And they're one of the 28 um, preferred bidders in South Africa's first round of renewable energy uh, independent power producer procurement program alongside Soitec. And that was the 36 uh, megawatt concentrated solar PV uh, pro, uh, a project, and they also have a significant women <clears throat> um, uh, ownership. Next slide. There, uh, Minister uh, Didiza hands over the award in the presence of uh, the president. Next slide. For the Job Creator Award, we had Cabo Kede, Motla Lefi, and Chuck Chili, which says, Beware the kick. Next slide. <clears throat> Cabo Kede uh, was uh, one of the winners. Uh, they located in Germison. Uh, they provide uh, uh, services for landfill operations and management, the rehabilitation of these landfill areas, waste collection uh, and training, and they're 100% uh, black owned. But I want to draw attention to the strong women owned um, element to 51% women owned, and they partner with municipalities to train youth. Next slide. Uh, we had a second winner here, Mola Lefi, Moshla Lefi. They uh, design and manufacture safety structures, roof tendons, and anchors for underground mining operations to address this problem of uh, fall of ground, which is the leading cause of death uh, uh, in South African mines. They've got the roofing and safety structures that they sell in the mining industry and that they export to Zambia and Zimbabwe, and they're looking now at the DRC. They, they, they've got an innovation team. They've generated their own patents and they've established technology partnerships with mining houses like Anglo-American. They've created 187 jobs. Uh, two thirds being young people, and they're one of the few black youth owned and managed uh, uh, companies servicing the mining sector. Uh, next slide. There we just see the uh, winners from uh, both companies, um, Cabo Kedi and Moshla Lefi Engineering, receiving uh, their awards with Minister. Uh, Kubai uh, proudly looking on. Next slide. This was for the Youth Industrialist Award. Again, Cape Bio was renominated for this as well as KTO, uh, Chet Lane Holdings, and Um 
uh, Claw Melo uh, Electronics and IT Solutions. Next slide. Uh, the winner was um, uh, Seth Lane Holdings, or uh, it's a student accommodation company. Uh, it's accredited by UJ for off campus student accommodation. And uh, they're housing 264 students, strong women ownership, and they employ 225 workers. Next slide. There's the um, <clears throat> uh, owner getting uh, the award from Minister Didiza. Next slide. These were the Women Industrialists Award. We had a number of um, uh, nominees. You see six nominees. We had more nominees for this category than any of the other categories. And we had two um, winners for this category also. Next slide. The first winner was Astrofica uh, and Astrofica Technologies, they design and build satellites and also manufacture ground-based support systems for the export market. They export to the UAE, Saudi Arabia, Europe, Australia, and the US. It's 50% women owned. It's rare in, in the industry. They meet uh, quite significant ISO standards. And the name Astrofica, which is a combination of Astro and Africa, uh, was conceptualized by Jesse Ndaba and Khalid Manju when they worked as interns in uh, one of the projects by the Department of Science and Innovation. The Astrofica satellite uh, competencies have gained um, experience in the, in the space sector over a long period. So they, they basically take those competencies to market and their business methodology that they, they've pioneered. So that's one of the, the winners uh, of the Women Industrialists. Um, and that's Jessin Daba. Next slide is a very different uh, product. Uh, this is Lindewe sanitary pads, which manufacture pads for both middle class and um, <clears throat> poorer Black South Africans in townships and urban and rural areas. They started with 14 jobs and now employ 90 people. They sell to government, to clicks and to cash and carry. They work uh, with NGOs and private businesses to raise money so that they can enable um, young girls in disadvantaged communities from accessing affordable sanitary pads. And they say more than 1,200 um, girls have benefited from just programs that are uh, in this category, besides the other work, uh, commercial work that they do. <clears throat> and they do charity work in high schools, universities, and villages in the Eastern Cape and Northwest. Next slide. <clears throat> There's the winner, uh, both winners, Afro, uh, Astrofica and Lindewe Sanitary Pads. Next slide. Brings us to the Black Export uh, Award. We had three um, uh, companies that were nominated. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> the winner was Microfinish. They make safety components for internal combustion engines in the auto uh, sector, as well as in marine and locomotive industries. Uh, this includes valve guides and valve seat inserts which are installed in the piston compartment and are directly responsible for engine efficiency. Uh, they also produce parts that are used on vehicle brake and clutch systems, and they export 98% of their production to the EU, to the US, and to the UK. And uh, they employ about 100 workers directly, and they support 300 indirect jobs. Next slide. Just shows the uh, then uh, Gauteng Premier joining us on the stage to provide the uh, to give the award to Microfinish. Uh, next slide. That brings us to the fifth and final platform uh, that we we had. This is research work undertaken on the impact of broad-based empowerment with the provisional results um, released. 
Uh, we have asked for further work to be commissioned, which will uh, next year provide a wider impact assessment of the transformation measures. And it's been supplemented by case studies of black industrialists. Next slide. Uh, the work uh, that was done by the DTIC group showed that more than 900 firms have been supported in the past six years from 2016, when uh, the Black Industrialist Program was specifically launched. And, and that 900 number excludes BEE transactions, where it is just shielding uh, in a company, but not uh, a company that is owned and uh, uh, controlled by Black South Africans. And um, these companies report that they've employed uh, about 70,000 workers over this period. And if we take it over a 12 year period, the initial projected uh, gross impact uh, for a 12 year period for the Black industrialists in the DTIC programs um, is 160 billion Rand. Uh, that work was done in the economic modeling. Uh, but we want to widen the scope, look at the number of other projects that uh, the DTIC is working on. And um, uh, we hope next year to be able to provide a, uh, a more uh, extensive figure on the impact of uh, broad-based Black economic empowerment on the GDP. Next slide. We looked at worker ownership. Uh, there are 450,000 workers in South Africa uh, employed by 72 companies uh, where those workers have shares in the companies that they work for. And uh, the DTIC now runs, uh, seek to, to, to monitor that through a register of companies known to have these employee share ownership programs. If we look beyond worker ownership to black entrepreneurs, just in the formal sector, uh, there were 337,000 black entrepreneurs in 2021 and 52%, uh, they make up 52% of the total. Uh, so even with a knock of COVID, uh, we still had uh, a significant number of black entrepreneurs in the formal sector of the economy. The next slide looks at the uh, impact of um, Black South Africans in management and professional occupations. And we took, we compared it from 2002 to 2020, because we had uh, uh, more credible data uh, from 2002 in the, uh, in the, in the statistics series. Uh, so it would have been even more interesting to look at it from 1994 or even 1993, but the data isn't as uh, credible. So in that period, in the private sector, we had uh, an increase uh, in the number of black people in management and professional occupations going up from about 300,000 to uh, about 870,000. In the public sector, it grew from about, let's call it 200,000, to about just over 500,000. And if you add public and private sector together, it grew from uh, 492,000 to 1.4 million uh, Black South Africans that are now in management and professional occupations over that uh, period. Next slide. Uh, the department also produced a publication which profiled Black industrialists and exporters. It was launched in the conference, but it was really a standalone publication. It's available in electronic form. Uh, the department is updating it, and we hope we can uh, have this as quite an important registry in future uh, that Black South Africans can use uh, to showcase their products. It's not all of the Black industrialists, just taken a slice of it because it would make it for a very thick publication if we had to bring everyone into it. Next slide. Post-event feedback, uh, there was a survey that the department uh, conducted, 200 participants came back with feedback um, and it was, it was quite positive. Uh, so Piso from Chuck Chili Foods, for example, uh, really valued the interaction with DFIs and the other stakeholders. Uh, 
um, Cindy Mabasso, Kuyana, uh, was, was impressed with the practical solutions that were provided. The fact the whole thing was very action driven. Yeshni Ramkison uh, highlighted the keynote address by the president. And um, she says, as a young female being part of this event for the first time motivates me to be better and to do more for the employees of our company. And Vin Naidu uh, of BK Steel uh, found the exhibitions in the stalls as the highlight. Next slide. This is a company that wrote in uh, specifically to, uh, to say how uh, much they valued this and who they uh, worked with and who they'd like to say thank you uh, to and um, also appreciated the, uh, uh, the, uh, the work that was done by the various entities of the DTIC and honorable members will see there the, the, the things that they say. Next slide. Uh, there was a lot of pre-conference publicity and post-conference publicity. Yeah, is the president um, uh, prior to the conference highlighting uh, uh, the importance of the conference. Many different business publications from News24 to Business Day um, covered it. Uh, 702 SAFM, CNBC Africa and SABC uh, TV as well well as, as, as radio. Next slide. These were just um, extracts. Uh, it's, the print is a bit small, but uh, publications and things highlighting uh, the storyline from the IDC, from um, the NEF, <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> the importance of small business to ignite South African growth. Next slide. And then post post conference, we had very extensive um, coverage of uh, what was said. Uh, it was spread uh, across many different publications. Next slide. Some conclusions. Next slide. I think on the whole, the conference was seen as a as an opportunity really for interaction. It was bringing people from across the country together and uh, for current clients of the DTIC group, they were able to showcase their products. It reinforced the support that's available to black industrialists and it highlighted the need for early stage development funding and some new ideas of how we can sharpen our, um, our support uh, programs. Next slide. Some of the industrialists took the opportunity uh, to interact with service providers uh, like transport or material supply. Um, some businesses are now recognized as innovators in their sector. Uh, for example, Moshla uh, uh, Lefi Engineering supplies the mining industry and Saudi Arabia is very keen to expand their own mining industry. So um, uh, uh, the company was invited to be part of the South African business delegation uh, for the state president for the president's state visit to Saudi Arabia. BT Industrial uh, and the NEF now are looking to establish uh, a partnership around the local knee needle and pre-filled syringe market. Next slide. Uh, the media appearance of the DFIs and the DTIC uh, in the week preceding and after conference helped to uh, make its services more widely known. And we even had the DFIs working more closely with each other. Uh, and uh, there was, uh, I was told there's a partnership uh, that is being explored uh, with uh, French and Italian potential investors. Uh, and also it highlighted the efforts and successes of South African industrialists in the economy. And a challenger storyline that 
the program is for politically connected people with no real businesses involved. And it also challenges storyline that there are no black industrialists in South Africa, or if they are, they perform low value adding activities. I think many people were just um, quite taken aback at the innovation, the high tech sectors that black South Africans were getting in and, um, and the, but also the struggles. Many, many, many of the businesses were saying how tough it is in global markets, but that's part of what the forum did. It, it provided an opportunity for all of this to come out. Next slide. Uh, we had put a, a senior team together from the whole DTIC group. In other words, this was an attempt at working as an integrated team uh, and not, not something that only one branch of the DTIC did. The overall coordinator was uh, Yunus Hussein of Invest South Africa. And Yunus um, uh, uh, was supported by Tsepo Ramodibe from uh, the IEDC. Shabir Khan is the acting director general in this period, Kinsani Mageza from the IDC and Malebo Mabichi Thompson, who uh, is a deputy DG. The support of the IDC, NAF and ECIC was really quite valuable. And their support was led by the CEOs and I'd like to, um, to express my appreciation. A lot of the work in the panels was done by the various staff in the ministry together with Ayabonga Tawe, supported by Stephen Hanevel. The marketplace was coordinated by Willem van der Spey from the export branch of the DTIC. And he had strong support from Mohamed Vauder from the competition branch and Kensani Mageza from the IDC. So they each brought different uh, elements to it to really showcase South African industrial capabilities. Work on the networks was led by uh, Malebo Mabichi Thompson with the support from Kahiso Mamabolo and Lerato Mataboche. The awards work was led by Jody Skoltz and the panel of judges. I've, I've highlighted who those panel of judges were. Uh, a lot of the media management and the marketing was led by Tsepo Ramodibe from the IDC. And we had strong support from GCIS and from um, there was support also from the DTIC media team. And conference attendance was driven by Annelise van der Merwe, uh, who did a lot of uh, work. She had strong support from Tembin Kosi Kula. And then we brought in a number of people from the spatial, the industrial, the finance, the export, and the competition branches, the IDC, the NEF, the Competition Commission, and the ministry staff. What it did highlight for us was that there wasn't an integrated database in the DTIC. And so each branch and each entity uh, keeps their own um, client list. And this was the first time there was an attempt to begin to bring these together. So uh, we've learned a lot here about the need to find better um, uh, um, uh, integration uh, in, a, in a common database across the DTIC group which is still a work in progress. Next slide. We were also um, supported by private sector sponsors, large South African companies, MTN, Sunlum, Aspen, Hollard, and Distel. There were international sponsors like Samsung, Fortune Steel, Unica, and Via Steel. There were black industrialists who sponsored the conference, Amca Products, African uh, Sun Oil, um, Agni Steel, that's a spelling error, it should be Agni Steel, Bliss Chemicals, Dersots, GQ Tissue, ProRoof, and Macrocom. And the next slide uh, looks at the next steps. For the Black Industrials Program, it's first to measure better, to do more research on the impact of broad-based Black economic empowerment, to learn what work best, and what requires change. It's to communicate better, to tell the stories of black industrialists uh, more confidently, for them to tell their stories. Uh, for all of us, members of parliament from all the different parties can begin to tell these stories of success, which can inspire many more young people to enter industry. It's to implement better, to improve the speed 
uh, of our, uh, our programs to secure more development and more jobs for the money invested and to scale up, to do more based on successful examples and shift resources from low impact to higher impact measures. Very many useful lessons have been learned from the conference where we know the department is clear to me in their advice. They say they can do even better next time. Although the um, uh, conference attendees were filled with um, a lot of positive feedback, the department has seen a few ideas that they can implement even better. And this will help to inform both the Black Industrialist Program and the information base being developed uh, by the DTIC. There's also wide support that we should have a similar conference. The debate is where that should be held annually, which is what uh, everybody is, 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 is beginning to push, or whether we do it every 18 months, that we can also have a regular place where there's a report back uh, to South Africa on the work uh, that is, is being done. The next slide is really just a few annexes. Uh, next slide in the annex is to uh, recall the three broad areas of focus of the, the transformation program. The next slide uh, thereafter, which is the final slide, just highlights 12 specific programs where black industrialists uh, are able to, um, to get some uh, support. Yeah. And, and some of these, uh, and all of these have some kind of DTIC link. And that brings the uh, presentation to a conclusion. And I'd like to hand back to uh, the chair. And as I hand back to the chair, I'd like to express the appreciation to the DTIC group. That's not only the department, but also the entities. And just as we saw with the WTO, uh, where that uh, picture of um, uh, our ambassador, uh, uh, Polelwa Mulumbi Peter, who's doing really great work in Geneva for uh, South Africa and for the DTIC. Uh, we've seen here also, um, we set a very high uh, goal and uh, the team lost a little bit of sleep, but they, they were beaming with delight when they saw it all come together uh, on the day of the conference and afterwards. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Thank you very much, Minister. Oh, have we managed to get sound? Chair, if we can just perhaps try one more time and see if uh, third okay. time lucky or, or not. The dawn of democracy in South Africa, unleashed entrepreneurial potential previously suppressed over decades and centuries. South Africa has reaped the benefit as black entrepreneurs have forged new paths in business, growing South Africa's economy and expanding employment. With a clear objective of creating multiple and diverse pathways and instruments to enable the entry of black industrialists into strategic and targeted industrial sectors and value chains, the government's black industrial program has achieved significant progress and is geared to further increase the participation of black industrialists in the national economy. Industrialists are important to market economies. Their activities not only drive economic growth, the jobs created are important for national development. In the context of South Africa and its history, the need to promote the creation and long-term sustainability of black industrialists was the driving force in establishing the Black Industrialists Program. Indeed, the South African economy can only grow if we bring more black South Africans into the productive economy. A new breed of black entrepreneurs is emerging this is a group of individuals who are directly involved in the origination, creation, significant ownership, management and operation of industrial enterprises. By creating new products and services, they stimulate employment and contribute to national economic development. Allow me to take you on a journey as we explore the work and successes of some of the black industrialists in South Africa. Let us hear their stories and just how they have emerged as recognizable industrialists 
amidst the various challenges that may have come their way. The BT Industrial Group is officially licensed to act as a manufacturer, distributor and exporter by the South African Health Products Regulatory Authority. We caught up with Mr. Komotso Likola. Komotso, pleasure to catch up with you again, my brother. Tell me a little bit more about your, your business journey before I discuss specifics with you. I um, went to school, university, uh, joined the corporate sector. About 15 years ago, I decided to go out on my own. I refocused my energies to trying to look more at systemic problems that um, the developing world, which is where we are, uh, w where we could have the biggest impact. Uh, so I went uh, deeper into engineering, where we were doing um, water management uh, on mines. And at the time, we were procuring pipes and yeah. other durable goods. Yes. And uh, myself and my team at the time, we got into a debate of saying, if we're going to be meaningfully impacting, should we be procuring? Sure. What if we actually made the products? We decided in 2018 to start producing pipes. And that's really where the story started, is that if you don't control the means of production, if you don't have the know-how, the capability, you are going to be subservient mm. to those who do. We found um, South African uh, uh, private sector companies that were interested in procuring our product, but we also became very successful overseas. We have not uh, done much commercial uh, engagement on the public sector. So you can imagine now we've developed this uh, really wonderful product. How do you then get it into public sector? Yeah. Do you do it through a tender? I don't know. So yeah. it's not an area that we've spent much time trying to unpack. We've uh, rather focused on where we knew yeah. we could make things work um, in the way which we understand. Moto, thank you very much eh, for talking to us. Sure. MCR Plastics is a manufacturer and distributor of automotive interior components based in Port Elizabeth. We linked up with Mr. Morgan Vatterboer to get a clearer insight on how he evolved from being an employee to become the supplier to VW. Quite an interesting journey, apparently, that you've traveled the past what, 20 years or so up to where MCR is today? For 17 years, I worked for Volkswagen where I will be traveling the world for a lot of projects that we signed off with regards to the tooling. In 2020, 19 was my biggest break within the market to see that there is more entrepreneurs like us needed within the industry to become uh, suppliers to the automotive sector. Hence, MCR Plastics was registered in 2017, but we only started to trade in 2019. Unfortunately, 2020 happened where COVID-19 was a, a devastated situation for MCR Plastic. Our breakthrough came through Volkswagen of South Africa, where we got our first contract for a local supplier within Kariga. Morgan, thank you very much and all the best to you. Highly appreciate it. Remco Manufacturing specializes in the manufacturing and supply of complex mechanical assemblies and components for the rail, telecoms, infrastructure and electrical sectors. Established in 2015, the company has a 51% black women ownership held by Mahuma Investment Holdings. The Mahuma siblings, Gwen and her brother Tebuho, let us in on their journey. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk to you about your business. Very fascinating story from what I've gathered. We grew up in a, in, a, in a family that was business orientated. The first transaction that we did, we, we have a company called Mahoma Investment Holdings. Mahoma Investment Holdings basically focuses in the infrastructure sector. So when we started initially, uh, we started by buying equity into a company that manufactured roof bolts for the mine. You manufacture petrol, the petrol pumps now? We are um, one of the main suppliers for Gibella and Alstom, who are manufacturing uh, trains for Prasa. Mm. So we make actually quite a hell of a lot of products for them. For them. And, and which is, brings me to my final question then, that you know, South Africa has got um, a variety of economic challenges. What do you think people should expect, those who want to be like you? As a black woman, who probably won't have access to a lot unlike our, our white counterparts.
think that oh, you obviously hope you'll get the funding, but we didn't think we will get it, and we got it because you had a, had a great idea. Thanks again for sitting down for this chat with me, and also educating me in the process. I appreciate it. No, thank you very much. We very appreciate much. the opportunity to be heard as well. <laughs> On the southern slopes of the Sopansberg, near Toyando in northern Limpopo, lies a citrus and banana farm spanning over 202 hectares. Easy Farm is an operation founded by an agricultural pioneer, Israel Nemaurani, in 1990. Easy Farm today has 115 hectares of citrus, mostly Valencias, and 60 to 70 hectares of bananas. We are now joined by Lavengua, Israel's son, who is currently running the farm. Tell me the uh, brief, the history of Easy Farm. How, how did it uh, become your family's asset and uh, now in full production mode where it is? Well, basically, my late dad started the farm in uh, 1990. We were still young by then. Uh, basically, he moved from Tembisa and then he bought himself a piece of land in Venda. Mm. Well, basically, our main crop is citrus. We've got different varieties of citrus. 80% um, of the citrus basically goes to the international market. The 20% goes either to the juice factories in Tanin or we sell it locally to the bucket tree. But the bananas is all local. Basically, basically I've got um, 60 hectares of land on the farm, which is still virgin land. I need to establish that on soft citrus, which I've already signed the contract with the owners of that certain cultivar. And yes, they are willing to to come on board. You actually triggered a thought in, in my mind that you could have chosen to be a consumer, but you chose to be a producer. producer. Yes. Thank you very much. Thanks. I appreciate it. VM Automotive, based in both East London and Eastern Cape, as well as in Roslyn, Gauteng, is a fully transformed 100% black-owned supplier of aluminium and steel automotive panels. As part of its flagship innovation, VM Automotive introduced laser blanking as a new technology in the manufacturing process for the latest C-Class Mercedes-Benz W206 model. Mr. Gibson Njenje took us in to share with us the journey as an industrialist in the automotive sector. Thanks, Pragib, for allowing me into your office space and having this opportunity to talk to you about uh, VM Automotive and your involvement in business. Um, how did you get involved in the automotive industry? No, thank you for coming through, Tim. Yes, we, I started the company in uh, 2012, and uh, uh, having been uh, interested in the automotives, but from 2013, I then focused on, on building my, my own uh, company. We started supplying the citizens from here, actually, okay. until the, 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 uh, the series the old series ran out with W205. Now they're running to W206. But W205, we supplied from here, from Roslyn. So in 2019, we put in a bid for, 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 for the contract of the W206 with Mercedes-Benz. And we went to our funders and told them, this is what we're doing, this, and would want you to support us. He said, okay, look at it. Let's see what, what it, it looks like. Per Gibson, Ginger, thank you very much for talking to me. I appreciate your time. Smith Capital designs and manufactures aerial platforms, drilling rigs, as well as truck-mounted cranes. A family business operated by Mrs. Fortunate and Mr. Sipo Mdanda. Mrs. Mdanda took us through her operations in Jamiston. And thanks for allowing us to pay you a visit here and look at your plant. Quite impressive work that's going on here. I would have thought that you've been in business for 20, 30 years, but interesting revealing that it's not so long time ago. No, not at all. We've only been in this journey for just five years. Mm. As, as a family, right? Yes, as a family. As I say, we, my husband and I, Sipom Danda, are yeah. in the business together. Yes. We ventured into this journey in 2015, uh, where we used all our savings and he left corporate. I still stayed on just a bit mm. to make sure we put everything in place. Uh, we sold his shares, we used our savings just to have the skin in the game. And mm. then we acquired our first business, which is Collega in KZN which designs, manufacture uh, truck bodies and trailers. Mm -hmm. uh, we acquired Col um, Smith Capital in 2015 November. 
we had to go and knock for funding. We knocked at different uh, commercial funding institutions. We knocked at, DF at DFIs as well, and uh, NEF did approve us. And, and how much support did they done. give you? We got a 26 million loan to acquire the business, mm -hmm. and we are quite grateful uh, because it allowed us to get funding at a very competitive price and weight sure. and terms. And also what we are very grateful for with this funding is it came with very, very good post funding support, mm. which I am assuming and I believe uh, most commercial funding institutions don't provide to that extent and also access to markets. So that, that was also a, a plus for us. Well, everything of the best to you and your family. Thank you so much, Tim. Thank and you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Sure. Amka is a South African homegrown company with over 60 years in the health and beauty industry. Upholding the vision of the black industrialist policy, Amka has created a platform to raise other industrialists. We met up with Mr. Nizam Kala and spoke to him about his participation in the advancement of the industrialization agenda. Well, gentlemen, thanks that we are able to chat, uh, Nizam. Going back to Maravastad days, and Jawu, going back to the Hilbro days. Thank you for having us here. And uh, if you look at it, we started as a small manufacturing operation and uh, we faced many challenges. Yeah, so uh, we are in different sectors. The personal care business is uh, broken up into skin care, fragrances, home care, uh, uh, sun care, oral care, and hair care products. So uh, the the IDC we started working with them since 1988, and the DTI has helped us with the place we're standing on currently, uh, with critical infrastructure program. So we've been blessed with uh, a lot of support, and we believe that this has helped us fast track our growth to become. Uh, a meaningful player in the market. Jabu, you had your own product range when I re refer to the Hilbro days and now you are part of the Amka group. You see, um, I had my own factory, you know, in Weinbeck. You know, every time when you grow into business, you know, the growth is costly. So it's either you need the external injection, the funding, or you partner with people that are sharing the same idea with you. Gentlemen, thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, my sure. brother. Thanks very much. Thank you, thank, thank, you, thank, you, thank, you, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Established in 2014 by two young black industrialists, Terence Liduma and Pumzi Lenkomo, Makamisa Foods specializes in the creation of flavored food sauces such as jalapeno and pickled vegetables. Makamisa has since grown to become a notable brand, drawing the attention of key players such as famous brands. We had a moment to engage Ms. Pumzile Nkomo, who let us in on their unique journey. Well, Ms. Pumzile, thanks very much for granting me the opportunity to talk to you about um, your business's remarkable story, or should I call it your remarkable story, because uh, you were there at the very beginning. We started the business, we were bootstrapping, um, it was my husband and I in the business, um, and we used to do expos and your family market, so we used to I used to sell. Um, I, I, I sold at the markets, and then he was negotiating bigger deals, and you know, um, trying to get us certified. Now, this product was done by my father um, in the kitchen at home, and so we were discovered at the market. So famous brands um, came to the facility where we were contract manufacturing our sauces and our relish and then they wanted to do business with us. So we approached the IDC um, back in 2016, 2017 um, and then we approached um, the DTI after that. Um, so they, in total, the total funding that they gave us was a, in, in about, it's about 66 million um, at the moment, which um, 44 constitutes the capex part of it and then the rest is, is just the OPEX. So they've, they've played a very big role in, in our lives and in the business, yeah. Sure. Okay. Good luck. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you sir. Sure. Thanks. With the type of support as we have seen, the Black Industrialist Program has impacted a wide range of sectors and industries across a range of youth and women-run businesses, including established entities. 
We therefore invite more entrepreneurs to step up as industrialists and take advantage of the schemes within the Black Industrialist Program, as this will surely help grow the South African economy. Thank you very much, Minister. I'm glad we had opportunity to see those videos. And I heard something very exciting here, post-funding support very critical. Can I just open up to members to um, for any comments, questions, or, or clarities they need? Members? It seems, okay, there we go, Honorable Swaku, and then Honorable Malamecha. Yeah, let's start with those two hands. Honorable Tswaku. No, thank you very much, Chair. <clears throat> um, I wanted to ask uh, the, if the TTIC has got these... Uh, can you move closer to your microphone, please? Okay, can you hear me now? A bit can closer. It's, okay, go ahead. Okay, no, thank you very much. I wanted to, to check, Chair. Can you hear me now? Yeah, just stay where you are because you're moving away, I think, from your mic when you are probably turning your head. Okay, you can hear me now. I'm audible. Yeah. Yeah. No, I wanted to say that um, when the TTIC has got these programs, why the committee members are not invited? Uh, that's, bro, I mean, for me, it would have been logic. It would have been logic that maybe. You know, you send a letter to the chair or secretary if whatever is going to be happening, then we'll make a decision whether we're available or not. So why are we not uh, invited into this black industrialist conferences and all these things that they are doing there? Okay, and then number two is, uh, I saw a slide on jobs and ownerships. I did not understand it quite well. Can the minister go back again there and so what he's talking about in terms of the, from 2020, I wanted to, to check on the period that we have, the budget was approved. How many jobs that we, we created? How many ownership by blacks? How many black industrialists that were supported in the period? Um, I mean, you can take it from maybe last financial year or, before that, just a short period in terms so that we can track the money that we have, we have approved. Is there any change now? Because I don't want us to claim uh, easy victories or from, from historical, you know. So I want to check at this point in time with the budget that has been signed off. Um, uh, 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 what has been a uh, what is the amount of money? So how many jobs that we create and how much is the amount of money given? Um, I think with these industrial programs that the DTI is having, maybe we should have a, I don't know, maybe it might be there. We might have a summary to say, in this period, we funded, we funded this campaign, I don't know, if it can be done with this company, this company created so many jobs. We funded this company and we done these jobs, like the whole of it, so that you can see if you are making any dent in in, in the in the in in the un, in the un, unemployment um, thing is, you know, uh, uh, you making any dent there, and and maybe creating jobs. Are you effectively? Uh, creating a job with the amount of money that you are spending. Is it really, really um, uh, uh, making a difference? Maybe, maybe you'll find that, in fact, you don't have to, <laughs> you don't have to create jobs. You just have to give people money. That's so, all, uh, Minister, because if you spend a billion, to create a thousand or two thousand jobs, 
and you've got a million people that are unemployed. What you could, what is a, you got what this amount, I think it's 4 million, eh? 4 to 5 million. So if you divide that by a billion, it means that you can give something, a person in a, a, a two, three million odd, you know, you can just give the man, the old people are employed, yeah, here's the man. So, 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 so we need to look into that. And, and I think we've been, we've been talking about it. Looking at the unemployment rate in South Africa, looking at the mandate of DTIC and see what impact are you, are you having in terms of creating the jobs and, 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 and creating them and ensure that people are employed. That would be very interesting to do as for your mandate. I think the, the industrialists have a problem Minister, with the markets. I don't know if I, I said that. Many of them have a problem with the market because when they apply or they do all this stuff, they have a market, for example, with the chickens, they will have a market for them to sell chickens or they have a market to, to supply the coal. Because remember, even this coal, they are taking from, from those who own the coal, who own the mines. And so many black people are not owning the mines. So many black people are not owning the means of production. Now, how is a department going to ensure that the market availability of the people you are funding is as stable as possible because you have another crisis now of the of a company that was had a contract to supply the coal, and now he applied to the TTIC. Now Escom no longer wants his services to to really do that, you know, to really transport the coal. Uh, what do you do? And there are many cases of this nature because many of these black industrialists do not own means of production. They don't own the minerals. They don't own the land. They don't own anything. They don't even have money. So it's a risk for them. I mean, I, I'm happy with the other uh, the presentation at the end of the Archer. It's, it's you know, innovative, it's, it's good. But what, how they can kill her is to increase the, the inputs because she doesn't have the land. They see that her stuff is, 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 is booming in the market and she's competing now with the famous brand. The only thing that they will do is that is to deal with her in the market where she'll be selling. And secondly, they will just ensure that to put the ingredients, her ingredients, the price of those uh, avocado, price of oil, price of whatever ingredients for Archa become so unreasonably high. How do you say to, how do you cushion that, that risk, uh, a minister? Because many of them they don't own means of production, which is fundamental for industrial for industrialization. Now, uh, what is your view? Because <clears throat> I don't see any players in the mining industry, like uh, you know, mining, mining, not supplying, but uh, the mining of minerals. Have you supported any black industrialists there? Uh, you know, mining of your minerals and you know the you know like the real stuff, man. Uh, I mean, real stuff like uranium, real stuff like gold, diamond, platinum. If you want a man, you've got black industrialists because when they <clears throat> when they mine that minister, the, the the platinum, they are able to create jobs because you you can beneficiate the, the platinum to produce a catalytic converter for the car. And you can export that. So while what is happening in that sector, it is very, very quiet. The last one, uh, Chair, is the is on agriculture. Yes, there's small drop there and there, but uh, we're not hearing an aggressive funding or industrial is there. Uh, because remember, small scale farming can create a massive jobs. Because if you've got small scale farmers and then you are employing 10 people and you've got a thousand of those. So a thousand multiplied by 10, those small farmers, you've got 10,000 already. So it's a massive employment uh, uh, that uh, thing is need to be done. But what is the department doing about those things there? And then also you, yeah, the, the very, very last one is the, 
you need we uh, minister i don't know if the if the chairperson have told you that there was a presentation from different uh, professors from different schools of thought on industrial policy i don't know maybe if you were appraised by the outcomes maybe the, the committee must give you must draft maybe a report uh, to look into it maybe uh, and send it to your uh, department for consideration because there is a country there are countries that were like similar to a situation that were like the vietnamese and in other areas that were uh, you know industrializing uh, they actually uh, are leading now or they are in the forefront of industrializing uh, but south africa is moving in a different direction we are running backwards i don't know that if you were uh, thing is you know you were appraised on that maybe uh, the chair and the secretariat must draft a report on the outcomes and what was presented, maybe to the interest to yourselves uh, and, the, and, and, and the committee and, and the study groups there in your department to really look into it. Uh, are you moving in the right direction now? But because scholars have said that, Woody, it looks as if you are running in a different direction. Have you looked into that report? Um, 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 can we appraise that maybe at some time after you, you, you study it? And, and you actually give us your view in terms of what you think. Thank you very much, Chair Nyabule. Thank you, Dr. Tswaku. Honorable Malamecha. No, thank you, Chair. Let me start by appreciating your presentation and further want to... Can you say... also move closer to your microphone, please? Am I audible, Chair? Okay, proceed. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Yeah, I'm saying let me come in the presentation and further say I was part of the conference myself. And uh, these kind of conferences, some of the conferences that we will really want to see them happening throughout the country, throughout the departments. There are things were done practically. We witnessed how people were happy, how people were helped. We witnessed how people are, put, are positive to ensure that they improve the economy of the South Africa. They also participate. I witnessed how people are tired of going out and look for jobs. Instead, they are creating jobs and there were no complaints. People were not politicizing. We're saying the following. With this conference, we've managed to navigate, we've managed to share skills. We have managed to interact with other people and out of this conference as the presenter itself is talking about the post conference those media statements they are still even today following some of us who were there and in a positive way bearing in mind that the conference came after the COVID-19 to have such magnitude events where people People were displaying their skills of how do they assist the economy that is coming from the pandemic and the unrest. I mean, the, 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 the July unrest. It, it was so positive. I think the minister and your team there, you must be applauded. And the very same people who took participation because their comrades, they were displaying what have they done to contribute to the high number called unemployment. You go to Venda. They were displaying how they hired people in the citrus banana field. You go to Whitland, you see the how she made sure that they get the high number of people. We are in a serious economic distress that will not need politics, but instead we need to all of us to work together to ensure that if we talk of black industrialists, we be positive and give them a positive support. The other aspect which was appreciated is the manner in which the funding is done. But what they've picked up, and which I believe we are also responding to that, is the lack of one-stop shop, where we must ensure that we assist people to comply, because many are things which we raised, raised by the very same applicants, is to say we realize that we don't comply with one, two, three, four. And by that time, the date is here, then we submit. In many a case, I was not aware. These are the things which we raised. And I think with the approach of one-stop shop that we are proposing in the department, 
that will also assist. The other aspect which was positive, we just need to see how do we work it because it will, it will require the other department to come in was the issue of transport to say, ah, as a fleet that is assisting us economically, so in terms of transporting whatever goods, why is not exempted from load shedding? Because if we are to deal with the target, in many a case, find that is load shedded and is stopped, it does not reach the market where we're supposed to do, and we are getting penalized. I'm saying the minister, without buying your face, one is very pleased that if these kind of programs can go throughout the, 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 the department, we can change this economy. I, I, I don't want to differ with what the doctor said, but I'm saying this thing of sitting in the offices and rely on the scholars who are not on the ground, it's not always correct what they come to their judgment. What it is on the ground is that people are there creating more jobs. We just need to unleash more funds, fund them. We just need to unleash land, give them. We just need to give them more support and ensure that they achieve the objective. Thank you very much, Comrade Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Malamecha. Honorable Minister. Well, first, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Um, and I'm glad uh, the video worked. Um, and uh, I, uh, I saw the chair, as I said, uh, at work on uh, the technical assistance to uh, Sulu. On a more serious note, Chair, uh, to Honorable Tswaku, uh, I note uh, Honorable Tswaku's uh, keenness to be um, invited to this. I take that to be really a, um, uh, a compliment on how uh, well the, uh, uh, the conference was, uh, was run. Um, and I, I, I'll bring that to the attention of the team in future. On the jobs ownership in individual black industrialists and the work, uh, the, the specific questions, we provide detailed reports on a quarterly basis. We also provide budget analysis, and we provide case studies in the quarterly reports uh, that are provided to, to Cabinet. Today's presentation was really to have a, an opportunity to showcase what was done at the Black Industrialist Conference. So that's not the same as the quarterly report of the department, which uh, is available. On the question of the, um, the kind of ways in which the state supports uh, job creation, we can do one of three things, and all three of them have their own. We can provide direct job opportunities through things like the social employment program that we highlighted in the quarterly report or the EPWP that other parts of government does. That has a role. We can provide uh, support to uh, small businesses in um, uh, uh, and startups and uh, people in the informal sector, where typically the capital required is relatively modest. And that also has a role because that can help to create uh, opportunities in townships, in rural areas, and um, uh, it can also help to absorb uh, people who otherwise may struggle to, uh, to uh, make ends meet. And then we can try to build a modern economic base, working in partnership with the private sector. Those require quite significant capital. In uh, most of the cases, the money, for example, that the IDC provides, it's not grants, it's loans. The NEF provide loans, these are paid back. And um, uh, if, you, if you're going to get to a point where you transform your auto sector, that Black South Africans are component manufacturers, this is a very capital uh, intensive sector. So we don't want to uh, ghettoize Black South Africans in only low value add products in the economy. Uh, black and white South Africans are building a, a modern, sophisticated economy, and our programs uh, are complementing and supporting the efforts there. On the question that Honorable Tswaku raised, uh, a lot of it is philosophical. Uh, uh, representing the ruling party, we have a different <clears throat> set of starting points and end points. For example, I don't believe that in a modern economy, 
the idea that it's only gold and platinum and um, <clears throat> uh, the other minerals that are the real stuff. Uh, in a modern economy, value is added through human skill and ingenuity, sometimes using your natural endowment. Those would be minerals, those would be climatic conditions that are uh, well disposed to agricultural production and adding value through innovation, through technology, through human skills and ingenuity. And that's the economy that we, we seek increasingly uh, to, to, to build and to strengthen. The mining sector has an important role in our economy. It, it provides an enormous resource base and we need to do more. And we are doing a lot more now on uh, promoting beneficiation. We've highlighted some of those examples in the quarterly reports. And um, as the DTIC group uh, provided support to black miners, yes, uh, they have uh, in the IDC annual reports and uh, various reports that the IDC has made available publicly, many of which are on the IDC's website, Honorable Swaku would be most delighted to see the many examples of what, uh, what has been done here. Uh, on the uh, the workshop that was held by the uh, committee, I'm uh, delighted that Honorable Swaku found the workshop stimulating and interesting. I am very familiar with the work of all the panelists that were there. Uh, I've worked very closely with Fiona Tregena. She also serves on the President's Economic Advisory Council. And so uh, many of the ideas that she's put in has been taken uh, uh, into account. And I've also nominated her in the past uh, to serve on the competition tribunal as a member of the tribunal, bringing a richer set of ideas and thoughts to our work. Neva Machetla, very familiar with her work. Uh, she works uh, for uh, an agency that the DTIC um, uh, draws on from time to time called TIPS. Neva served as uh, one of my advisors. Uh, she's also served as a deputy DG in uh, the department previously. Uh, and she still from time to time render uh, work for, for us and gives insights. So we're very familiar with uh, all of that. Uh, Chris Malikani, um, in 2009, had done some work for us uh, on various aspects of economic policy. Uh, so, uh, Honorable um, Tsuaku, um, let's say that these are areas that government has done some careful thinking over the years. There's a lot of uh, schools of thought that we draw on. Um, but at the end of the, of the day, as Honorable uh, Chris uh, Malimecha had indicated, our job is to make sure that uh, we, we help partner the private sector. Uh, in this case, I've highlighted the work we've done with black industrialists, but there are also a number of instances where we provide partnership with white South Africans. There are examples where we provide partnership with foreign investors. And all of these together represents our, um, our economic uh, support program and um, in spite of heavy um, headwinds uh, that many of the entrepreneurs in the economy face we also have many success stories and it's great to be able to tell those success stories not because they are not problems not because we're in denial about the challenges that we must address uh, challenges like the energy challenges and others but societies move themselves forward. They're able to, uh, to, to, to deal with the difficulties that they have when they also have inspiration, when they also get inspired by successes. And this is what the present today, presentation today highlighted. And they highlighted only a sprinkling of cases because, uh, of course, the, the universe of Black South African contribution to the economy is much wider than the few examples that I was able to cite. But nonetheless, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson, for this opportunity for us to be able to uh, provide uh, some feedback to the committee, to get some uh, feedback from the committee. And there's a nice symmetry between the trade discussion this morning that deals with the issues of opening up markets and the um, Black Industrialist Program 
of uh, uh, that we've just covered now, which looks at how to utilize opportunities in those markets. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Tuaku, do you have a follow-up question? Yes, Chairman. Your Chairperson, sorry. <laughs> chairman. Yes. Yes, Chairperson. No, I wanted to say that I think that the 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 the, the, the response uh, in terms of the minister. Um, it's what I wanted to to know. Uh, 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 a person. Mine is a, I, I believe in science, not just imagining things. Um, one, what I said was that with the jobs that I have been created, are you making a dent? Do you feel comfortable that you're making a dent in the, in the un, unemployment bloodbath? Are you getting the value for money now? That is a very simple answer. I, I know this because I'm on the ground and uh, I'm not in some boardroom. I, I look at the theory and I look at the, at the at, after the theory, I tend to look at the, at the practicality. Now, with the sprinkle of jobs that have been presented there, like 100, 200, 2000, or like that. So I wanted to, for it, the, the minister to say in the period, because it's a question, in the period that they are there, not like refer me, ah, okay, fine, I'll get it from, from those uh, references that he has told me about. Maybe, uh, maybe ask the question again to him so that I can, I say with the money that we have approved as a committee, is he happy about the, 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 the job that has been created now uh, and with all of this? And then I asked when I went to, I said to him that I, I didn't ask that if you know the scholars. We know the scholars because we read their publications. We have no problem. We're saying that the, we took an initiative as a committee invited scholars. We I was suggesting that we give him a report to look at the deliberation, at the science, at the trends that are there. And, and also we want his views. Maybe could have said, no, it's fine. I will look at the report. Maybe they, 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 they must appraise me. Uh, I wanted to say the content, not the individuals, he knows them. We know all of them. I mean, we, we at School of Thought said, they came and they presented to us. There was different school of thoughts from the ANC, from uh, 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 the DA and other political parties ourselves. But, uh, you know, there was some deliberation. Look at the deliberations. And maybe at some point, uh, look at what we have, the work we've done, because we also, I mean, guiding them because there was some very good data there that was, you know, uh, presented by all scholars to assist him to, you know, to be able to, you know, uh, uh, to think is, you know, you know, to create jobs. But uh, it's, uh, it's fine. Uh, we all want jobs to be, you know, uh, created. We read. Uh, and also when I chair, we, we, we look at the solutions and saying that in there, was, there are a, a, a companies that, sorry, countries that were in the same situation as us. Uh, and they must also look into that and look at the work that we're also trying to do in ourselves. Thank you, my chair. Thank you very much, Honorable uh, Dr. Tswaku. I think we will, uh, Minister, request you to maybe at a later stage, brief the uh, portfolio committee on that quarterly report that you prepare for, for cabinet. Um, I don't know if you want to respond to anything else that Dr. Tswaku raised. Uh, Chair, perhaps just to say the quarterly report that I'm referring to is the quarterly report we provide to the portfolio committee, and I'm looking forward to the next one uh, too. Uh, really just to, Take note of uh, Honorable Tsuaku's uh, uh, comments. Um, Honorable Tsuaku has asked the same question during the quarter one, quarter two report, and I replied to that question uh, in considerable detail. Um, I don't think I can add more to the question uh, that was asked there. And really the reason for saying we are familiar with the work of the scholars is the point that I made. 
that having taken into account the views of scholars across many different disciplines and different schools of thought, at the end of the day, public policy uh, is about choices we make. We've made those choices in the Black Industrialist Program, the choices we made there, uh, there are a number of successes, there are a number of challenges, uh, but we've also been able to celebrate those successes. And I, I'm sure that both Honorable Tsuaku and the other members of the committee will join us in celebrating the successes of people who've built uh, significant businesses and um, uh, who operate in very, very challenging markets. So thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. I think uh, that's really all that I want to add. Yeah, thank you very much uh, to the minister and your team and for this uh, uh, two for the two presentations you 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 gave us today. It is highly appreciated. Uh, members, in lieu of the time, it's now two minutes past three. The next agenda item which deals with the B Triple R, um, the formal consideration. I've taken a decision to move that to um, for us to deliberate on that tomorrow morning and um, in our session where we, uh, where we meet as a portfolio committee before we start the rest of the business for today. Um, can I just ask the secretary to brief us on tomorrow's program? Um, thank you, Chairperson. Chair, we're scheduled to get a briefing from the MISA and SANAS on the annual report and first quarter um, non-financial and financial performance for this financial year, Chair. And as you indicated, we will start with the consideration of the BRI. And as I forwarded the draft report, two members are updated version thereof, which include the, the submission from the EFF for members' consideration. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, members, for attending and everyone on the platform, uh, South Africa at large. Um, thank you very much for being part of our deliberations here today. I adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Thank you to our chairperson. Don't leave the chair. Don't leave the chair.